Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by the always impressive with his new PRs, Father Moses McPherson. How are you doing today, sir? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Well, appreciate you coming back. Um, and you are the person I want to talk to about today's conversation. We've kind of been going back and forth privately talking about fasting, lifting, helping uh, some of the Orthodox Christians, maybe they're new into a sort of athletics lifestyle and how we could even do that during Lent. So I expect we're going to be touching on a wide variety of topics today. Um, so any before we go, start, I was going to ask you anything new with you. Uh, you, you I've seen you've been all around uh, YouTube on different YouTube channels, uh, talking, sharing advice with people. Anything new with your life? Not to do exciting, just been uh, in a training cycle now for a while. Haven't been, thank God, knock on wood, I haven't been injured in a couple months, really. I mean, that's great. And uh, God willing, I'll I'll be competing next month. So I'm hoping, and it's a lofty goal, but I'm hoping to hit a 1,700 total. In a, in a wow. Of so, I mean, it's not the ultimate goal, but it's a stepping stone to get there. So well, when's the competition? It's uh, March 16th, so it's right before Lent starts. So it's like perfect, wow. just smoke myself and then uh, <laughs> all days of prostrations afterwards. You know, there you go. <laughs> so, not you know, you don't get to choose when they are, but yeah, so that's what I'm uh, supposed to hit a supposed to hit a decent squat tomorrow night. So, if I can hit a decent squat tomorrow night, if tomorrow night, I like you know, it's a confidence thing. I mean, competing right. is so different than training. Because, right. um, 
it's just, it, you know, you're under much more intense scrutiny. You've got to put all of the lifts together in one day. Um, you know, there's like unforeseen things. There's just multiple dynamics and it's not the same as doing something at your house. That being right. said, if you do it right, you should always be hitting PRs that you don't hit in the gym, you know, when you actually are on game day, because, you know, you're rested up, you've taken four or five days off, you're fully recovered, you're like hydrated and, and uh, ready to rock on game day. So like that there's, you know, I've, I always do better on game day than I do in training. So that's right. good. It's just, it's a matter of like keeping your foot on the gas pedal just enough that you're like in the red, but not so far that you kind of like, tear anything or blow the engine you know so it's <laughs> i was gonna like, ask you yeah. do you taper your your routine as you get closer to the competition how do you how do you adjust i assume you probably take off a lot of load you mentioned like four to five day rest what is yeah. the training techniques for powerlifting competition so you'll pretty much train everything kind of pretty normal up through the last week ish and okay. everybody's a little different that's how i do with my coach and then the week of the competition on say Monday. So I normally train Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. So on Monday I would do maybe 85% and I would do all three lifts. Mm. So, so it's more just technique at that point. You're not mm -hmm. exerting any real effort at 80, 85% for just a single, you know what I mean? So right. um, you're just doing muscle memory and just kind of getting some movement. And then I typically will take off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then Friday I'll have weigh-ins and then Saturday morning or Saturday day will be the actual competition. So, I see. Yeah. Well, what initially got you into powerlifting? Was this something that from childhood or what it's a different lifestyle. So I'm curious what, what got you into the powerlifting? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So like I used to rock climb a lot. I was like, well, that was one of the things that happened when I became a Christian was like, I started to find, um, you know, this is like right around 18. I started to find like healthy pursuits and things to do. Right. And like, you've got to spend time doing stuff. You're not just like reading the Bible 10 hours a day. So, and you don't have a wife. I don't have a, I didn't have a wife, didn't have kids. So you got to have a hobby. You got to have something to do. And so I got into rock climbing, got really into rock climbing and rock climbed for probably four years straight. Um, three days a week was really serious. Hit a really, hit a, hit a really high level was kind of like, uh, um, I, I don't know how you'd put it, but kind of like in the semi-professional range, um, nobody's making any money in rock. I'm, I'm good at picking, <laughs> no. I'm good at picking sports where there's like absolutely zero financial return. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. Major uh, physical stress. No, no monetary reward. <laughs> dangerous. It's like dangerous costs money is like beats up your body. And it's like no financial return whatsoever. It's like, perfect. That's for me. <laughs> so I got into rock climb and loved it. And then did it for a few years and then got injured and other things. It just kind of got out of it. And then as I was making changes in my life, right when I became Orthodox, you know, my first great Lent, I was 25, became Orthodox and started to make some major changes in terms of working on my spiritual life and what was going on with kind of my past and everything else. And so one of the, the big changes I did was I stopped drinking um, mm -hmm. altogether. And, and one of the things that I found was like, I need something to do. And I realized like, I do better when I'm doing something physical, it's just better for me all the way around. So that's how I did it. I had a, my homeboy, Manuel, who's still a good friend of mine. We, uh, you know, got gym memberships to 24 hour fitness. And <laughs> yeah you know, started lifting weights at 24 hour fitness. And then like, we were doing bodybuilding stuff and just doing a bunch of volume and whatever else. And I was like, it's just not really me. It was just kind of boring. Like I like having goals. Like that's one of the things with rock climbing is there's grades of the climbs and you're constantly pursuing like a next level in that grade. Right. And so like with bodybuilding, you're kind of like, I don't know, like, well, maybe I'm going to put a half inch on my bicep. It's like, that's not really a goal. You know what I mean? And or I'm like, I'm going to look better. And at that point, like I'd already been married for five years. My wife is gorgeous. I'm like, I'm not out trying to find a wife or a woman or anything else. So it's like, you know, I don't know. Just bodybuilding just was like, I appreciate it for what it is. You know right. what I'm saying? Um, I can appreciate for what it is, but yeah, it just, I needed a goal. I needed something to do. And so you know, this was like 2005. This was like really during the, 
the kind of peak, the heyday of West Side Barbell. Right. And um, Super Training Gym was big at the time with, mm-hmm. with Mark Bell and, uh, you know, guys online like my coach, Pete Rubish, were putting stuff out and were competing. And so I just, I love the idea of just chasing numbers because that's an accomplishment. It's a tangible accomplishment. Right. Right. And so, yeah. And then I like, I just liked powerlifting at that time with West Side Barbell was like, intense crazy you know everybody was crazy chuck vogelpool people were just you know it was like high level of intensity and i had aggression and intensity and and internal dysfunction for days <laughs> just getting all psyched up and and going crazy at the gym and screaming and slapping each other in the face and hitting pneumonia just all of that was was i just loved it so right you know, I, I ended up hanging out with some guys that were like really intense powerlifter, one, one of which was a guy named Thad Coleman. Oh, and yeah. uh, he was a really well known powerlifter, big, I mean, huge. I mean, first time I ever met him, I think he's 6'3, six, 6'4. Six, he was like, I think over 300 pounds at the time, 350 or something. <sighs> and I remember showing up to the gym because I had heard that these guys train, and he was like, What's up, homie? And he put his hand out, dude. <laughs> and I have like good, like I have big hands. And my hand was like a child. In his <laughs> hand. And I was like, hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> so anyways, like just training with those guys and just the, the intensity, the aggression, everything was, um, I just, I love that environment. You know, I, I love it. You know, it's funny. Right. We joke my wife and I, right? Because if you looked at my wife and like her perfect day is like, I don't know, listening to whatever garbage at Starbucks, some, you know, something soothing and having some kind of soy decaf drink and reading a book, you know what I mean? And like, or gazing out at the ocean, you know, and like my perfect day is like a powerlifting meet, insanity, like loud noise, intensity, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. uh, we're just wired differently. So, yeah. Well, yeah. po- powerlifting is definitely a different vibe just from even general gym culture. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a little it's, bit more intense, it's, it's, especially it's, the competitions. If anybody's ever been to a powerlifting competition, yeah. it's intense. It, and, and it's like most, a lot of the powerlifting too. I don't like a lot of the powerlifting today in the fact that a lot of it is kind of sedated. It's not as like, if you look at the best guys right now and I have mm-hmm. like, all due respect for like a John Hack or a Jamal Brown, but they're like mellow dudes. You know what I mean? And they're like, they come up and they just pull 900 and it's like, right. and that's it. And it's like nothing. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's so anticlimactic when you watch them lift. But um, yeah, back in the day when you would watch videos of like my coach, Pete Rubish or whoever, and they would just go ballistic, you know, they would just go crazy. And then, yeah, if you go to a powerlifting competition, it's like it the funniest part about a powerlifting competition is like there will be so many uh like protestant christian guys there it's mm-hmm. so interesting like there's so many guys that have christian tattoos and you'll have everything from like guys that have a christian tattoo to guys that have like devil tattoos on them like literally you know right. what i mean and like but everybody's like the super most intense personalities like the personalities are not like mellow sedated it's you know it's intense it's It's very intense yeah well that kind of leads into the question i wanted to begin with in regards to our conversation today on athletic competition physical fitness and a general warrior spirit this has come up multiple times when i've done live streams on masculinity Mm -hmm. and some of the young guys um, well, just last night I had a conversation in the premium members meeting on my website. And one of the guys talks about he's, he's a uh, life cradle Orthodox, an American man. And he was talking about how now in his thirties, he realized that all the time he played video games, he mm. kind of participated in, uh, more juvenile activities that he realizes that he never really developed himself physically and he was asking like well what what does the orthodox teach about warriors because we were talking about physical violence military battles this type of thing various saints and i think that's something that is really 
needed to be discussed because even I'm sure you've seen it. There's a the general characteristic that if you do too much physical stuff, then you're too worldly. You're not orthodox enough. You're not praying enough. You're not, you know, you're not living your ascetic lifestyle the way you need no. to. And so I wanted to open by asking you, what is the orthodox spiritual position on athletic competition, competition, generally speaking, and a, a sort of physical presence and development for men? Yeah. So like, and, and I'll point something out that's really, it's kind of interesting because I saw this on Twitter last week was there was all these posts about how priests shouldn't be fat and all this other stuff. Right. So there's this, like, there's this, there's this kind of weird duality of like priests should, should priests have sedentary jobs being a priest I mean, aside from standing in the services, even standing in the services is not an athletic feat, right? I mean, it's it's a low calorie job, right? <laughs> people were commenting yeah. on like how priests are out of shape or overweight. It's like, well, yeah, most men in their 40s and 50s, their testosterone starts to drop off. Right. If they have a desk job and they're not working physically five, six, seven, eight hours a day don't have anything to develop their physical well-being. So the irony to me is it's like people are criticizing priests for being quote unquote fat. And then they're criticizing people for like, I did something and somebody was like, oh, this is all world. I go, so you can't have it either way. Like if I exercise as a priest, I'm being worldly. Right. And if I don't exercise and start getting fat because I'm sedentary all the time, you're gluttonous. Then I'm glutton. Then I'm, then I'm, a, yeah. So it's like, what, neither what way I should listen to you. Yeah. It's like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm lost either way. So let's, let's distill it down to what it really has to do with. The church's understanding is asceticism. The word asceticism means to train the body, mm -hmm. meaning that the body, remember that in the fall, pre fallen world, the fathers tell us, and, and St. Isaac the Syrian and, and others tell us the soul ruled over the body and that in the fallen world, that relationship became inverted and the body started to rule over the soul. And so we have all the practices in the church are guided towards basically dominating your body and bringing it back into submission so that your body does what you want it to do and it doesn't do what it wants to do. What does your body want to do? Well, all of us have a natural inclination to be lazy right. and to be sedentary. In right. fact, when we look at the, the curse of the man, which is also a blessing, the Lord says you will basically till the earth by the sweat of your brow. So there's a salvific element to hard work and, and labor. Why? Because it chastises the body and does, doesn't give the body comfort. Right. If you understand to distill down the philokalia, the ascetical writings of the father, everything has to do with physical training, not giving your body comfort, bringing it into submission. That's completely applicable to everyone. The question is, to what degree do you need to do that? And, and to what degree does that pertain to your mode of life? So one of the things, and I, and I should probably put it out or print it, but there's a booklet that I have from St. Paisios. And I think it's from the 80s, but it's his commentary on like modern man. Mm. And he basically says, look, all these young dudes who show up the monastery, they're all worthless. <laughs> they can't, he's like, they can't do physical work all or right. lazy. He's like, they don't know how to work hard. When you read the life of St. Paisios, yes, St. Paisios was probably maybe 125 pounds or something. But I mean, he would work as a carpenter for massive amounts of hours every single day. Right. He was right. very physically able. That was not an issue. In right. fact, we often read. I was thinking about this the other day with St. Joseph the Hesychast. His brother, according to the flesh, Arsenios, was known to be basically the pack mule for the whole brotherhood. Oh. He was known to travel all over Mount Athos. And he was commended for this because he was so physically uh, strong that he was able to carry the loads all over the place on Mount Athos. So there was nobody going, oh, Arsenios is too physical. He's too strong. He, he like, <laughs> right. this is, he's like keeping us alive and he's like delivering food for us and everything else. So the question I would pose is it's only has a, the difference is only in degrees, right? right? A married man has a unique set of circumstances that he has to do as a head of the family and as a husband for a wife that are unique, that are not the same as a monastic. 
Right. A monastic can be engaging in very long and serious and rigorous fasting, like going three days, the first day of great, or the first three days of Lent without food or going the first five days. All of those are well and good, but the whole point is it's not the fasting in and of itself. It's the struggle. And so a married man can, it can enter into that struggle. There's a story with, I believe, I, I want to say it's St. Nicodemus or St. Nicophoros or somebody. And they had, they went all of great Lent without food. Wow. And God granted them a vision and, and they saw another monk who had gone like three days without food and really fasting. And he was like in his cell and he was like totally worn out, physically exhausted. And the saint asked God, what's the meaning of this vision? And God told him, he said, you went through Lent without food by the grace of the Holy Spirit. This monk struggled not to eat for three days and has completely worn himself out. And then, and then he, the saint asked God, what will his reward be? And God says, the same as yours. Oh, yeah. Right? So it's always, the fathers are always talking about according to our situation, according to our strength. That's right. why I mentioned recently, and a lot of people are not aware of this, there's a quote from St. John Climacus in the Ladder of Divine Ascent, where he says, one brother eats a pound of bread and is not gluttonous, and the other brother eats like two ounces of bread and is gluttonous. And it's like, why is that? Well, the reason for that is, is because one brother is eating according to his needs, and the other brother is eating more. It's not about how than he needed. It's not about how much they needed because everybody's body's different. Right. There's not one type of body. There's not one type of caloric intake. So I think that that kind of gives a general sense of the need for asceticism is monastic or married. The people drawing the correlation that we should be living as monastics is like, that's not realistic. Right. I, I, I don't have the opportunity to be in services for five or six hours a day. I, I can't, if I go and work a physical job, like my, I own a construction company, right? That's like my handyman remodel. I don't get to knock off in the afternoon and go back to my cell because I'm tired and the abbot says it's okay. Right. It's like I have to work the whole day out in the sun and do the work. And so I need to be physically capable to do that work to provide for my family. Right. right? So I hope that answers it or gives some kind of references. Yeah, well, it it brings a spiritual framework onto physical prowessness, uh, physicality, generally speaking. And there's a general tendency I've I've seen in some of the orthospheres to sort of criticize athletics and all sports competition. And I'm sure both of us would agree that you know the meme of sports ball and the sort of uh, gladiatorial events of the Roman Empire to sort of pacify the population. And certainly that's true in America to some some extent. And we see the corporatization of all professional sports. But at the same time, things like the UFC and hockey or even football, the NFL, it's still like one of the last vestiges of men, masculinity, uh, competition, and even people speaking openly about Christ and their faith. And so yeah. I was wondering if you could speak then to on Orthodox athletes and how to how from an Orthodox front of do we see competition itself as something that's good and not something that's like, oh, again, too worldly or too vain. Or why would you put all your efforts into, you know, playing basketball or something like this? Well, yeah. And I think that there's a distinction, too, that we would both agree on, which is being a spectator for hours every week and doing you know, I mean, I used to watch basketball back before I had kids and I had downtime, right? Like right. Um, there just came a point where I was like, I, I just can't dedicate the time to watching basketball. But the point is, is that when people become enamored with sports, what I found is they spend umpteen hours every week watching those sports, reading the news on them, checking the message boards, doing all that. It's a huge time commitment my argument would be that there's there's no return on investment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, Absolutely. you're not, you're not more physically capable because you watched five hours of football. Right. Whereas if you joined a football team and actually did something, you would be in shape. I mean, the number again, the number one metric for long life and health and longevity is that you exercise. It is literally like 
the metric. If you, right. if you, even if you exercise and smoke, you will live longer on average than the person who doesn't exercise and doesn't smoke. Right. Like that's how prolific exercise is. So I would make the argument. It's one of those things that is intrinsic and natural to our being. It's a weird convert culture in America that has kind of uh, monasticized everything. Right. And separated, you know, kind of the spiritual from the physical in a kind of platonic dualism. Right. Or when I'm doing spiritual stuff, that's spiritual. When I'm reading the fathers, now I'm being spiritual. Right. It's like, well, what if you're taking your kids for a walk? That's not spiritual. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? What if you're right. having fun? What if you're playing? What if you're taught? I mean, look at a child. They have endless energy. You're not like, hey, kids, we need to sit down and do five hours of the Holy Fathers today. You're like, we got to get out to the park and then we've got to run you ragged and then we're going to go home and then we're going to take you somewhere else and run you ragged again. And then you're going to get on the trampoline tonight and then you're going to do that, right? Why? Because they have so much energy. So right. I think sometimes this stuff that's coming from people that are anti-physicality, they just don't have kids. They right. don't have a family. They're just young and they think, that it's that they're going to live in some kind of ethereal state of just reading the fathers and, 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 and non-physicality. It's absurd. Now, as far as Orthodox athletes, I mean, the one that I can speak to who's probably spoken the most would be Troy Polamalu. Yep. Right. Um, well, maybe, right now the NBA, we got Jokic is the number one NBA yeah. player in the world. Orthodox. Um, Novak, the number one tennis player in the world, Orthodox. Yeah. Tapuria just beat he, – he's a Georgian-Spanish origin, and he just won the, the – uh, what was it, featherweight or lightweight title in the UFC this past Saturday. So there's Orthodox athletes all over the place. Yeah, we have Lasha Telegazi, the greatest weightlifter of all time. Yeah, well, time. Georgian Orthodox Christians dominate arm wrestling. <laughs> so Russians yeah. and Georgians oh, that's dominate. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, again – from nor the, the, I think the problem is is that people are trying to create a a hyper spirituality that is detached from the world and detached from real life. The only way that you can do that is if you don't have a family. Right. If you have a family, you realize really quick like you have to do stuff with your kids. And the stuff that you're going to do with your kids, especially if you have boys, is going to be physical. Right. If you don't do it, they have so much energy that it's going to go south. So what were the things that Troy Polamalu talked about? He's like teamwork. You, when you play a sports, it's you're, you're learning how to communicate. You're learning how to work as a team. You're learning how not to be selfish or make it all about yourself. Uh, you're, you're, you're listening to other people. You're being obedient to your coach. There's so many different things. These are all virtuous aspects that you learn through right. playing the game, Absolutely. you you have to play according to the rules. You have to show up to practice on time. Uh, you have to watch what you eat. You have to get enough sleep. This is all character building. There's literally none of this that isn't virtuous or character building. It's all virtuous. So there's no downside for children to be involved in sports. Literally no downside. Now, right. Why isn't that normal? Well, that is normal. That's how God created us to be. Every society, I think, pretty much has had games, uh, rights of initiation, mm -hmm. rights to manhood. all And all of these things have been based on your physical performance. Why? Because if you're part of a community, your job is to be an asset, not a liability. Right. If you're if you're a 19 to 22 year old ortho bro that doesn't work out and we have a work day at the church, you're not helping. Very right. I mean, I've seen it. You're just not helping very much. Why? You're not in shape. Right. And we've got things to do. Like we well, just built a big cross for our church. Like, I saw that. You posted yeah. it on, on social media. I saw that. And again, it ties back to the conversation we had last night in our and our think tank meeting is that the the gentleman who was forthcoming about his sort of um, self criticism that he never developed himself physically is that now he's in his thirties and he looks back and he spent so much time living vicariously through video game characters that would have all these attributes and you would be able to physically dominate or or go through a journey and attain certain goals and connecting it back to the sports ball 
it, you know, there's really no difference between the emasculated Zoomer who's playing video games all the time and the overweight, gluttonous boomer who's watching sports um, mm. all the time. It's both a passivity and it, it is a failure to recognize that appreciating skill sets, so professional skill sets, I think that's good. So if somebody's great at something, there's nothing wrong with that. But you need to also be working on yourself. And this was one of the things that the gentleman last night, he felt bad about because he's like, yeah, I really don't have any physical skills. You know, my work is on the computer and now I'm in my 30s and I feel like I need to, you know, what he considered gain like a warrior spirit. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have, you know, <laughs> and maybe you can speak to this. Um, not like you're violent, but there's a violent um, intention to like attain goals, just like powerlifting, just like if you're going to the gym and some guys have never developed or experienced that within themselves. Yeah. So are you asking what, a, what that is or sure. you're asking how to Wherever develop to that go. or what? Both, both, whatever, how, whatever you want to take that. Yeah. I mean, so like, I mean, one of the ways that I've understood it is what we would call it in, in dogs is gameness. Mm. They would say that the dog has gameness in them. Right. It has a desire to win or doesn't, or it has a desire not to lose. It has a desire for competition. So I would make the argument, even the guy who's sitting around playing video games has some desire to win and some gameness. It's just misdirected. Right. Most of the Great stuff point. that, most of the stuff that is wrong, it is like the boomer who's like watching the sports ball. He's watching somebody else and he's playing vicariously through them. He doesn't accomplish anything and he doesn't train his body. And since we only after we have work and our family and our wives, we have a limited amount of time. If you devote all that time to watching somebody else do something, you reap no benefit from it. You have to go out there and do it. But it very much touches and and taps into uh, a core desire within yourself, which is to compete. Right. And so there was an article I saw recently. I didn't read it, but it basically said when men watch their team win, it actually peaks their testosterone. Right. So they have a physiological I saw something like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a physiological response to winning and watching and feeling like winners. That's the whole thing that's weird. Not weird, I would say, about sports, but the kind of the again, I don't think there's anything wrong with watching sports. The problem uh, is, right is when it gets out of out of whack. Yes. When it's, you know, when it's like fantasy football in the chat rooms and now and somebody's spending 20 hours a week. Right devoted to footballs that's a very strange right and then you meet them and they're soy and they're soft and they're pudgy yeah. and and they have no physical prowess and then they go on twitter and they'll mock a professional athlete because he dropped a, a game-winning touchdown or something <laughs> <laughs> it's like dude yeah a little self-perspective here you know my favorite like my favorite of, uh, uh, example is there was a player on the on the Celtics called Brian Scalabrini are you familiar oh, yeah, with Yeah yeah the white boy oh yeah oh, yeah yeah the white chocolate so <laughs> people were talking all kinds of trash about I think about him specifically like oh he's da 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 and he he had this quote he said I'm closer to LeBron James than you are to me and what people didn't realize was Br Brian I think was was 67 or 68 230 pounds Right. Super nimble, like right. genetics that were way beyond everybody else. He just playing at the very pinnacle top of the pyramid. And so people thought, oh, well, he's not that good. So he did a thing on a radio show where they lined up three one on ones. It was like the local hooping legend, the local D1 a former athlete and some guy maybe who played ball overseas. Yeah. In three one-on-one -on -one games, I think there was a total of like two points scored on him <laughs> and he played them back to back. And he, I mean, he just smoked everybody. So right. when people are thinking that athletes are like, Oh, they're kind of at this level. They're so far beyond what normal people are that it is. It's an absolute gifting. It is. It's a gift. Right. And there is something wonderful and kind and, and beautiful about sports, even. Yes. Uh, when you see somebody do something that's phenomenal and exceptional, 
like there's a reason that we're attracted to watching it. What we don't want to do is uh, idealize it and and turn it into an idol in our life, meaning that it takes away from the enjoyment of life. But certainly I remember talking with my cousin about this and he was like he grew up grow going to baseball games and whatnot with my uncle and his brother. And he was like, it was our bonding time together, you, right. you know, and they bonded over them. And he's got a super tight relationship with my, with my uncle, right. His dad. And it's like, that's what they bonded over. They went to sports games together and did that stuff. He also played baseball himself. He also right. played at a high level actually uh, in high school. And was very serious about it. And my uncle also lifted weights. He's my uncle's in his seventies now, still lifts weights, right? So it wasn't detached from what they were actually doing, also. And that's where I think it can get really easily out of whack for people, right? So. Well, just like the gentleman uh, last night, and we were talking about how he's never been like the sort of. <clears throat> and I don't mean to take this too far, but the sort of central character in his own story. Yeah. So he's always been living through vicariously through other people when it comes to any sort of physical ability or physical feat and competition, I would argue is inherently masculine. And this is part with the participation trophy culture. And this is, yeah. this is slowly a feminization because as you said, there's a testosterone release in men just from being part of a team they watch win. And so we're inherently to compete against each other and to desire success and skill sets and winning and some some guys just never thought about, well, you know, you're the central character in your own story. Like, you need to go lift the weights. You need to set goals. You need to accomplish things. It, it's it, like one of the things that you're hitting on is like it, these are inherent. This is not we're not theologizing something that we're making up and saying men should do. We're, we're literally just saying this is how men are. Right. Right. If you get two guys, what I can't remember what we were doing the other day. But we were unloading weights the other day in the gym. And then all of a sudden I was like, I got to beat you (laughs) unloading the weights faster. Why? I have no idea why that is, but I can tell I have five sons and I can tell you competition is flat out ornate, like innate, sorry, innate to, to the masculine ethos, men who don't want to compete. Are, are missing something. And most of the time, honestly, it's that they're just really low testosterone. So they think that they're men, but they have low testosterone and they're physically underdeveloped. And so they're like pushing a, an ideology or an insight that's based on the fact that they're, that they're just not very developed as men. And, right. since, and since they can't compete with other men, they would rather pull them down rather than build themselves up. So right. they're like, Oh, competition is an orthodox. It's like, you couldn't even compete if you tried. So what is even, I mean, like, what does it even matter? Right. It just, it, it doesn't make a difference. Competition is part of how we better ourselves as men. Right. And when we see another man doing something better than us, we're like, Ooh, I would like to do it better than him. Right. And that's not a bad thing. Why? No. Because we both end up getting better when we do that. Right. It, there's a difference between jealousy and seeing somebody accomplish things that you want and working towards that. That is not exactly the same thing. And I think the jealousy part is people, that's where they want to pull them down, is they're maybe jealous of what they did, but they it's not a competitive spirit in the sense, well, I'm going to work and make sure I can do that too, or even do it better. It's that, oh, well, they can do something and I wish I could do it, but they shouldn't do it because of X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's like it's it's almost like people who've never been on a job site before. You ever <laughs> dig a ditch? Like if you have to dig a ditch on a job, like my first job, like my first real job was a plumber when I was 18. And I was a plumber basically for two years. Maybe I was 19 to 21. I was a plumber crawling under houses, soldering pipes. I, I had a buddy that I worked with. We ran around, did plumbing, Southern California, high end house. You ever dig a trench? It sucks. Right. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. But if you have somebody else that's also digging that ditch, it turns into a game. That's right. what competition is. It's taking something that's boring and mundane and making it more enjoyable by trying to outperform somebody else. And in the process, you end up getting more done quicker and it's funner because you've made it a game. It's like, well, what is that? It's, that's what boys do. Right. Little boys do this. They're like, 
it, you know, if you get two kids and they're like sloughing around putting Legos away, you're like, whoever gets the Legos away first gets this candy. It's like, boom, like everybody's like, <laughs> yeah. working out, right? because there's the carrot, there's, there's the bragging rights or there's the candy, there's the tree. So all of that stuff comes naturally to us. I don't, I don't know why people think that this is some kind of, I don't know, we're, again, it's just, I think it's just a people who are, they're not really developed as men and right. so they have these fantasy ideas about being a man and, and the, yeah. Well, I, I want to speak to that in a second. It, the first comment I was going to make is the most masculine work environment I lived in or lived in, worked in was actually car sales. Uh, it, it's all men. All the numbers are on the board. Everybody knows how many cars are sold and everybody knows how much each other's making. And it, it, it depends on how much you get done. And it is, and most of the car salesmen are very competitive. They're all like, most of them were like it, formerly into sports or former athletes. And it is cutthroat. But at the same time, you're friends with them, but then they will do anything they can to get the, the, the car sold out from underneath you or anything, but very masculine environment. And, and tying into what you just said, I think what's happening in contemporary culture, because so many men are effeminate so many men are shying away from competition in any regards uh, to their life that the piety signaling, this is something we talked about last time you're on. This is a way to outcompete people on a new game board, a game board that doesn't really exist, but you can't compete in other ways. So you, you demonstrate how much more pious you are, how much more humble you are, how much more you pray. And I think this is coming from, and you can, I'm curious your opinion to speak on this, a coming from a sort of new orientation to compete with men and reestablish yourself in a hierarchy. I think so. And the, and the problem with this is it just ends up being ego, right? Like right. it's just, it's, it's, it's turning the spiritual life into something that is external as opposed to something that is internal. Right. And I and I do I do think for some people it's a grab that they're gonna say, Oh, I'm 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 not doing all that stuff. I'm fasting or I'm praying or whatever. And it's like you don't know how much other people fast or pray or what they've done aesthetically. There's a good chance that there are people who are 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 pushing it a lot harder than you. They're just not saying anything about it. Right. And uh, which would be the orthodox way to go about it, right? No monk is yeah. bragging about how many hours in prayer they are each day or each week. Yet yeah. I think there's a, again, I would argue, as I said, competition is inherently masculine and men, we are constantly sorting ourselves out in, into a hierarchy. If you walk into a gym, everybody already knows who's who. If you're in a gym culture, everybody knows who's the strongest, who who's the best at X, Y, Z, any sports, any gym and pick up basketball, men are constantly sorting themselves out through competition of who has better skill sets and abilities. And, but they're doing it as boys. Like it, it's not even men. It's, it's boys. It's, it's like from their youth, yeah. that's what boys do. I mean, all I do right. is, I mean, I hang out with my boys all the time, but if somebody comes on the screen, I, there was one, not that long ago, we saw a video or something of Chris Bumstead. Uh -huh. What's the question? The question from my sons, they're like, dad, are you stronger than him? <laughs> they want to know, like, where does dad rank? Or if we watch a strongman competition, they're, they're like, can you do that? Are you stronger? They want to know where does dad line up in the dominance hierarchy? Right. And honestly, by default, by being my son's, in a way they kind of feel like they get to participate in that. Like, right. like, well, that's my dad, you know, my dad. But in a way they do. Right. But this is another yeah. thing that's lost from masculinity is ancestral identity. I know your, your sons yeah. aren't your ancestors, but I'm saying just generally speaking, I've, I've done streams talking about the loss of identity in America. There is no unified identity to be an American. Like what, what do you assimilate to? What are the, this is being eroded. And I think orthodoxy helps provide American men with a new identity, a, a new orientation, a new way to approach life. But understanding that, you know, my grand, my great grandfather did X, Y, Z, or he died in this battle, or he accomplished these things. Yeah. People don't even have a perspective of family history and identity and accomplishments of great men. 
It, 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 I mean, I so like my ancestry is Scottish. I'm predominantly Scottish. Explains the the powerlifting. <laughs> well, and it, it, w when you look back at Scottish culture, the interesting thing was Scottish culture was the Highland Games, right? And and it's just like it says, it's games. It was games that men and boys played in order to prove that they were worthy competitors and that they were a value to the clan. And in fact. You know, people represented their clans as showing that we're the best clan. Like, like we have so and so; he can toss the stone the farthest. We we know that he's the strongest of all the clans. And then, even extrapolating that out to the to the the stones of strength, there's all these stones all over Scotland that are outside of pubs and other places. And the funniest thing is the challenge would be to to lift these stones up to your right. chest and if you could do that if you could lift the stones up to your chest or you could set them on something or you could walk with them it was proving that you were a man right that you had cultivated man strength right so strength is never a weakness you know that, that there's a great quote from mark bell strength is never a weakness i love that no one no one ever said oh man i really wish you know the farmer was weaker <laughs> Yeah, I really wish I really wish a guy laying bricks was weaker and, and got less accomplished in a day. Everybody who's had a helper, who's had to work in the trades, who's had to work a man job has realized that strength is a benefit. So when you have guys who are online talking about, you know, why this is a distraction or this or that or whatever, 99 percent of the time, they just don't work man jobs. They're right. computer programmers or right. whatever. Now. I'm not saying computer programming isn't a man job, but let's be realistic. It's not a man job. Okay. Right. It's just not, it's just not. Right. Is it, does it mean that it, it's effeminate to computer program? No, it's not effeminate either. It just doesn't require physical some innate yeah. Yeah. abilities that a man possesses. Right. Men built society. They built the cities, the streets, the plumbing, the electrical men did all of that. And they did it because they have a superior physical prowess. Right. When you work in the trades and, and, and you work a physical job, people rally behind the guy who is strong. Right. It, it, because why? They know that he's going to help them accomplish the goal and get the mission completed. Right. That's what they want to do. So this sort of stuff with ancestry, too, in America is truthfully, I think a big part of it is the fact that we've really dunked on the last wars that we were in. Yeah. We dunked on the the, the war against terror. To a degree, uh, America really betrayed the Vietnam vets. Yep. So nobody seems to take any pride in their service in in Vietnam by large. By and large, or it was hushed for a long time, decades. Right. People didn't talk about that stuff. Right. Uh, and then on top of that, we don't have real rites of passage in America. The only rites of passage I can think of are like graduating college, driver's license. Yeah, graduate driver's college. license, graduate college, get a job, like. You know, none of those are. Um, I mean, certainly, graduating college is a is a is a good work, and it takes tenacity. It takes it takes diligence and hard work, and and you have to show up. But it isn't the same as pushing yourself physically. So, right. well, and a couple questions that I want to bring up from the chat here. Andrew makes the point that we're generally making is that you can't escape competition, be it sports, working out, or even gaming. Uh, even from the most soy to the most base agreed. And this leads into maybe a critical question that we're receiving from John L is dominance and submission and a social hierarchy Christ-like, isn't it pride? Um, how does this square up with being brothers in Christ? So insinuating that, um, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled a bit by the question because we can't avoid any social hierarchy, but, moving forward and elevating through various hierarchies, be it at the gym, be it in your job, be it in the church, uh, spiritual life. These are all uh, meritocratic hierarchies. But how would you respond with uh, John saying, is dominance and submission in a social hierarchy Christ-like? Isn't this pride? Well, I, what I would say is that is I, I don't think that we have dominance. I think what we have are, are people who are dominant but the whole purpose of being dominant, like I said, even in even in the trades, is to help your team win. Right. 
So when you're doing stuff for the community, like over the years, I mean, I've helped, I mean, I'm not saying this is, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm just saying many times I've helped people move. When I was in seminary, I probably was the most requested mover <laughs> for everybody moving out of seminary or unloading or whatever else. Why is that? It's like, what? Well, I was stronger than everybody. So everybody knew that I would get more accomplished. Or if you needed to load a, a moving truck, I knew how to load a moving truck. So I wasn't getting paid for it. It wasn't about making money. It was like, uh, like you said, Patrick, the hierarchy is innate. Like you can't it, avoid it. Just, it. You can't avoid it. It just, right. you don't want to compete for money because it's, you don't want to worship mammon yet. You're not becoming more successful and more skilled so that you can offer more, um, offerings to the world through your skill set to be compensated right. monetarily. It's like I talk with some guys and they 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 are almost avoiding any form of competition as worldliness. Even at the same point, they're saying they want a woman, an Orthodox girl to marry them and they want to raise a family. And then you ask them, well, right. what's your skill set? Oh, well, I don't really have one. I haven't figured it out yet. Well, then what what, do you, what were we talking about? Well, you know, I, I, I'm really reading my religious books and my theology. It's like, ah. okay. But you, you got to make money. What are you talking about? You got to make money. <laughs> Dude, I just, <laughs> there was, this was years ago. No, uh, and uh, somebody was interested in dating a woman at, um, uh, that I knew. And I was like, okay. I'm like, what do you do for work? And they were like, oh, I'm basically doing academics. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, what are you going to do after that? And they're like, well, I'm going to get a job as a teacher doing some teaching. I'm like, okay. I'm like, how much money are you planning on making doing this? And they're like, um, <laughs> they're like, uh, what do they say? Oh, like 35 to 45,000 a year. I was like, how are you going to have a family? Right. Like, you, you know, my basic just basic bills of like feeding my kids and paying my mortgage for where I live. And, and I'm not even living like a high standard of living. I just, you know, when I buy food, if I buy a loaf of bread, it's gone in a day. <laughs> if I take my kid, like my kids went to in and out the other day, my wife just took four kids to in and out. They ordered 12 patties wow. for four kids and they're all 11 and under. Okay. That was like 28 bucks. So if I go out to eat or I'm going to feed my family, or we went to a taco place the other day, they had $2 and 50 cent tacos. Okay. And my wife didn't eat and the baby doesn't eat. And my bill was still like 35 bucks. So I don't know where people get this idea that they're going to have families or not use contraceptives, which is what they should be doing. They should be having kids. Right. And then somehow, how are they going to afford to to feed them? I mean, it's it's in excess of eighty thousand dollars a year for me to have my family. Right. That's just real talk. Those are just, and it's more than that. Honestly, that's just real talk. And that's not setting money aside for college. That's not investing. Right. That's like bare minimum paying for food, paying for a mortgage, paying for gas, homeschooling. It's expensive. I don't know where people get this idea that they're going to not make money, get a woman and then somehow live off of next to nothing. And I'll tell you this too. This is all real talk. Like right. I've been at the point where I rented a house. I've been at the point where I rented uh, a, in a duplex or a, a sixplex one time. And you live in a sixplex with neighbors and you have two or three kids. All your neighbors hate you. <laughs> they, hate, they do. They hate you. I, I'm serious because they're like, why do you live here with kids? They want to play music loud. They want to smoke weed. They want to come and go. They don't want to hear babies crying through the wall. Right. Your, your wife doesn't want to be cooped up in an 800 square foot house. That's not even a house because it's got neighbors on each side. Right. This is real talk. Like this is real practical talk. You, you want some place where your family can thrive and, and flourish. You need to buy a house. Ideally at some point, I mean, I was, you know, I had four kids, three kids, I think by the time I bought my first house. And so I'm saying that from experience, I've certainly had times of making less money. Uh, 
but one of the number one things I realized, like the one of the best gift I could give my family is making money for them. Right. Like, I mean, that's one of the number one things that I can do is provide a standard of living for my wife where she can buy the groceries that she wants. And, wife, and planning, you know, having monetary goals, having a plan for the future. This is not the worship of mammon. This is something that every adult Orthodox man yeah. should be thinking about when they yeah. talk about how they want to have a family. And then they have these naive fairy tale dreams of one, how they're going to attract a woman. And then two, how they're actually going to afford to take care of that. Well, and, and, and thinking like you're going to have a wife and then of course you're, you're devoted. So you're like, okay, we'll have as many kids as possible. It's like, and how are you going to pay for them? Right. Oh, like, well, father, it's, it, you know, I, I've watched some TikTok videos and I've seen people with homesteads and they're making a lot less and they're getting by. It's like, yeah, what? That's not, I mean, and the crazy part is about homesteading, like nobody tells you is to get into homesteading is like a half a million to a million dollars to buy something that's even somewhat functional just to get in because you can't buy it. The bank won't loan you the money for a homestead. It's right. it's it's not a reliable investment for the bank. I've looked into buying land and land is so hard to buy because it's not a reliable investment. It doesn't return anything. And if it doesn't have a house and you can't live on it, you can't do anything. It's just, this is a lot of fantasy talk. This is a great thing to talk about because the illusion that people have or the delusion that people are under that they're going to have kids and have as many kids as God blesses them with, which is absolutely what I recommend. Absolutely. Is, that's what we need. Which is wonderful. But are you prepared to pay for it? Just, just to give real numbers. I don't even live in the most expensive area, but let's just say for baseline, my mortgage is 2,200 a month. That's cheap. I right. bought my house like three years ago. That's not an expensive mortgage. Okay. My food bill is probably in excess of $2,000 a month. So not even including electricity, water, all the other stuff that goes into it, gas, all that. Let's just say just to have a roof over the head with no bills paid, just a roof and to feed four growing boys because the baby just drinks milk. So four growing boys and a wife, you're talking that's $50,000. Right. Just baseline. Like that's nothing else. That's not health insurance, retirement, time off. I mean, go on down the list anyway. So yeah, the idea yeah. that these, that these people are thinking like, I'm going to get a degree in philosophy or something and then get a teaching job where I'm making 35 to $50,000 a year. And then I'm going to have a stay at home wife is like, you're going to be living in an apartment. <laughs> if you can afford that. If I mean, rent, rent, rent's well, going gonna up living, dramatically now too. So you're going to be living in an apartment on welfare and right. your wife is going to be really bummed out. <laughs> oh, right. Like, when she has that second or third kid and she's like, Hey, this is not fun anymore. And yeah, it ain't right. fun, and it, it's not a good time. Well, I want to speak to then why sports and athletics helps give men confidence that also helps them figure out their skill set and earn money. And so it's harder, I would say, for some of these guys that have never competed at anything, they have a lack of self-confidence. And so then when it comes to the real world and money, that's also another form of competition. Obviously, we don't worship money or mammon. This is just practicalities if you're going to be a householder and you're going to have yeah. a family. So if you are, this is the this is part of your spiritual responsibility. And so you got to step up to that plate. And I think a man who is going to the gym, say, let's just say a 25-year-old guy right now, maybe he's finished college, doesn't have a job set, kind of lost about the future. But if he's going to the gym regularly, if he's staying physically fit, I almost guarantee he has more confidence about figuring it out and competing in the workplace and, and trying to get a better situation financially so that he can take care of the things that he wants in the future, where people that have never competed at anything almost shy away from that. Well, and the thing is that he understands the principles of hard work. So he understands that what he puts into it is what he's going to get out of it. Right. So the same, I mean, the same spiritual laws that govern weightlifting govern making money also 
you have to be diligent. You have to be hardworking. You have to educate yourself. You have to know more than other people. And I'll tell you, I mean, this is one of those things that my wife and I, when we were, we got married young, I was 20, she was 21 and we were married and we didn't want to have kids. We were going to college. We were Protestant. So we didn't think there was anything wrong with waiting to have kids. I had zero interest in making money at that point. Zero. And I didn't really make money. We went to college. We went and got summer jobs that were fun. We lived in Yosemite Valley. I mean, we had a blast. We did all kinds of stuff. But what we didn't do was make money. And that only lasts when you don't have kids. When you have kids and you start having to feed people and now your wife can't go to work anymore, guess what? Really quickly, you realize like it's all on you. So when my wife had our first kid, I was working three jobs at that point. I was working for a moving company. I was working for a caterer and I was working for a steakhouse. I was working three jobs. I worked all through seminary. I was like one of the only guys who worked all through seminary. I had no money. I had not saved up any money. I didn't come to seminary with any money. I didn't have any financial backers. I just worked. And the thing that you realize, like, that's what it is. As a husband, it's a lot of hard work. If you want a life that's quote unquote more balanced and it's not about making money and it's, and it's prayerful, go be a monk. Like a hundred percent. Like this is not the calling for you. Right. If you want a wife and you want to have kids and a family, your primary job as a husband, when we say, okay, yes, I understand you're the spiritual leader. Okay. We've covered that. Now we can move on to reality. The reality is, is your primary job is to provide food for your family and shelter. Right. That's, I mean, St. Paul literally is like, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't deserve to eat. Our, your job, I don't know where we lost this. I don't know if everybody's just used to handouts from their parents or other people taking care of them, or they've just never thought about having money. But I mean, it hits you like a ton of bricks. Right. That is your job. And so going to the gym, again, I've never, I've, I've just, I've not met a people who go to the gym who are not diligent people. <laughs> They, right. It, right. Why? Because it cultivates self-respect. Right. It cultivates discipline. It cultivates taking care of yourself. Uh, there's so many different levels. Some of the smartest, like literally smartest guys that I've ever met were gym guys. And they were, you know, some of the guys that I've met who are the most financially successful, a, a consistent theme has been that they're gym guys. Right. And that they enjoy taking care of themselves, life and at work and everything else, just like they enjoy competing in the gym. Right. They're very successful. I mean, it's funny. I was at a competition lately, recently. This dude is all jacked. We're talking. I'm like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I own basically three companies. <laughs> it's like, and he's just like, you know, covered in tattoos, all, you know, crazy looking. And he's like, yeah, I own a company that does steel. I own a company that does, uh, uh, what's it called? Cranes or something like this. And da, 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 da. He's like, yeah, I, we became friends on Instagram. It's like all of his photos are like sports cars and all this other stuff. <laughs> and it's like, but what is it? It's a guy who is competitive, who hits it hard, who right. wants to do well. Right. And we had a very generous super chat came in from Slade throws in a hundred dollars. Thank you so much, Slade. He says, father Moses out here, matching his physical strength with his spiritual strength. His position of discipline and asceticism makes total sense. Your family needs to be confident in your ability to take care of them. Do not squander the gift of your physicality. I love that. Do you know Slade? Do you know him or no? I do not. You do? Yeah. Well, Slade, yeah. Like, so we'll give a little shout out to Slade because Slade was, was a member of SEAL Team 6. Oh, wow. So Slade's like a tier one operator, 17 years in the Navy SEALs, like legit, a man's man, a man's man. Yeah. So, uh, very, very, very competent individual for his skill set. So, well, we had a, uh, member of your parish, Jose, he, he's, a he prominently shows up on some of our open panels. Very, very sharp guy. Yeah. And we were talking to somebody in the open panel was bringing up some of the ortho guys and maybe some of their, uh, lack of a physical prowess. He's like, Oh man, not my parish father Moses. We got a bunch of guys that, <laughs> and so he was, 
he was very supportive of the type of parish you've cultivated in Texas. It's you know it's weird too is like I've cultivated with some of the guys and some of the guys brought it to the parish, but any guy who's brought any inkling has had it reinforced, mm. right? So if you come to the parish, there's like there's at least two guys, almost a third guy that that deadlift over 500 pounds. Dang, that are just guys, right? They compete. Two of the guys compete. Three, all three of them compete actually. Um. There's a guy who benches. I think he benches just over 300. Um, you know, so, and, and the other thing is, there's guys who do MMA. And uh, I, I think it's just, once you cultivate it, that environment, um, doing something like building that big cross project at the church. Yeah. It's no big deal. It's like every dude, there's like 10, 15 guys, every dude's in shape. You, you know, you give you give the, the digger, the digging machine to the dudes, they knock out digging the hole. We laid out the cross. We did a bunch of cutting. I mean, obviously carpentry is my skill. So we have all the tools and it's just, everybody's working together at it. It's a very cool environment, but next project is we're going to paint the church. So we're going to pressure wash the church, tape it off, paint it. We do most of the work ourselves on our parish. And that's awesome. I mean, we demoed all the floors before we um, did the, get the tile work done. Again, all of these things, the physicality is an asset to your community, to your parish, to the people around you. If somebody needs to move, it's like no big deal. <laughs> There's like five guys that will come help you move. No big deal. Like we got it covered. Uh, so the physicality blesses the people around you. It always should be a blessing. That's exactly what I was telling yeah. uh, our men's group because we're – uh, getting ready to put in some free weights and a squat rack and stuff down in the basement of our church. And the goal was that in case anything was locked down, we can always come to the parish and work out and also teach the younger guys how to lift correctly, proper form, all this different stuff. Yeah. And um, we were speaking about how building yourself up physically is capable. And again, it's not meaning that you're C bum. You know, the goal is you're not going to be stepping on stage to be a bodybuilder, but being physically capable. There is an experience I had where one of the very pious uh, members of our parish, uh, a older man and woman who travel some distance to come to church every Sunday, it was during last Lent came and it was a it was a liturgy during the week, and we were doing prostrations. And this man is can hardly walk. And he got down on his knees fully and prostrated during the service, but he couldn't get back up. And mm. the rest of the parish, other than me, were all older people. And then I saw his wife, who, who's also elderly, kind of like her eyes open. She's kind of in shock because she realized her husband stuck on the ground. And I was able to go up uh, behind him, put my arms under his armpits and lift him back onto his feet. And my point was me exercising and lifting weights isn't just for me. It's for the people around me mm. and, and understanding that we're of service as Christians. And that maybe you could speak to this is, is how you're still offering yourself as a man. You take less than you give to the world, to your family. And this is part of our masculine duty, but being physically capable also allows you to offer more to the people around you. So, you know, the, the the monotonous, you know, getting the annual Christmas tree out from the basement or carrying stuff up, but the protection, you know, I was, I, we spoke in the men's group. Well, what if somebody comes into our, our church and they're crazed or demonically possessed and they're trying to harm people during the liturgy or stop the liturgy? Who's going to stop them? Mm. Who, who's going to make sure that they get taken care of and get kick, kicked out of the church? Yeah. And I mean, even more so than that, I mean, when you're a, when you're a husband everything, all the protection of your family falls on you right. and your capabilities. I mean, I, I was thinking about this in terms of prep preparing for this podcast. And I was thinking about the other day, we had an issue in dead stop traffic and I didn't realize it till I came up right on the person, which was their car was completely broken down. They had an electric vehicle that something had broken down on it. So I angled my truck, put it in park, jumped out, told him to put it in neutral and started pushing. And this other guy got out of his truck. He's like, he's like, hey, man, you need a hand? I was like, not really. Like, but you can help. Yeah, like we can do this together. It's fine. But what what, what happened? 
this person's car broke down. Everybody just drove around them. Nobody offered a hand. Nobody offered help. So me and this dude, we just pushed it, got it off of the road, got it out of the way, and then everything went on. That was all normal. That like just that's normal. That's not exceptional. That that's right. right? That's that's not exceptional. And and here I want to I want to respond to something because somebody I Slade sent me a text message and he said he said uh yeah, somebody, Eric, said, yes, physical fitness and self-discipline are virtues, but I don't see any saint ever speak like this about fitness. Like, well, you've never seen a saint speak against it either. <laughs> right, yes. Well, yes. So, but, but why is that? Because it's normal. Like, in an Orthodox country, I mean, think about all the Orthodox countries. Think about all of the um, Olympians that come from those countries. There's no Orthodox saints who are like, oh, we shouldn't be competing in the Olympics or we shouldn't have sports or right. we shouldn't have this or that. They never spoke against it. Why is it? Because it was a normal part of culture. Th that's the weird part is in America, the converts are like, we need a theology of exercise or sport or whatever. And it's like, why? You don't need to theologize this stuff. The only reason that we're explaining it is because people seem to have a, a weird understanding about actually just being physically fit. Right, They've lost Whereas the plot. Yeah, I mean, dude, bef before the last 20 years, the majority of men worked physical jobs or at least 50% of men or so worked physical jobs. During the Great Depression, you want to know the best job to have during the Great Depression? It was to be a blue, blue collar worker. They right. actually had the most physically or uh, financially sustainable job during that time because people always needed it. The drop off in physicality in our culture has to do with the workforce and what's expe expected. The, the drop off in physicality in kids has to do with the cultivation of the internet. It doesn't have anything to do with what's normal in society. And I'm sure if you talk to any saint and said, what's better for my kids, them sitting home and reading a book or them going out and playing soccer, they're going to be like, kids need to play soccer. They need to do physical stuff. They need to play. In fact, I think it's St. Ambrose of Optina talked about basically how you shouldn't even start kids in school till they're like eight or nine years old. He's like, because kids need a play. Right. That's, this isn't a weird concept. So when you had adult men in your society who were plumbers or bricklayers, yeah, you're right. They didn't come home and lift weights. I used to roof, you know, as a commercial roofer for 50 hours every week, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day, Monday through Friday. I didn't lift weights. I mean, I, I didn't need to lift weights. Right. I was in phenomenal shape. I was climbing ladders and hauling stuff onto the roof every single day. So the reason that we have kind of exercise in sports or we're even talking about it is because so many people have a, have, have sedentary jobs exactly. and they're just not doing this stuff anymore. And right. so they're losing all their physicality. When we get into those first four days of Lent and we have – uh, the canon of St. Andrew, people are like, oh my goodness, it's like 50 prostrations a day or something. Like, <laughs> this is not, this is not some mind blowing asceticism. Right. This is not. Uh, just, people were, I mean, even think about women. I mean, b before people had uh, uh, running water, people hauled water, people cultivated the food, people walked places and carried things. This was all normal. We've just lost all of it because our society has become very automated. <clears throat> right. And so we've lost the physical component. And in the process, we don't realize what we've lost until it's already gone. So. Right. Then I was just trying to explain this to people <laughs> as well, because they'll say, well, you know, I, I can understand being uh, physically capable and doing performing manual labor. But, you know, all that gym stuff, that's just vanity. That That's not that's not really useful. That's just you and your ego. And certainly it can be the case. And I want you to speak a little bit to where the line of vanity is. Uh, Cause that's really uh, difficult to pinpoint. And it really depends on the person and how they are viewing their activity. But we, do, we are not as physical and people aren't living physical manual lives like they used to uh, for centuries. So now a lot of people are sedentary. They're, they're eating poisonous food. They're not even eating healthy. They're putting crap in their system. They're inundated with propaganda and social media and dopamine hits. 
Mm. They do nothing that actually stresses the body for it to come back a little bit stronger in response. And so what do you tell? Because I saw somebody even in the chat here make a, a comment about, well, you know, you, you don't want to be too uh, too vain. And if you if you go to the gym too much, well, then it's going to turn into vanity and it's a spiritual problem. Yeah, I mean, that's it's it's that funny. Uh, I can't remember who which saint it was. Um, he talks about the prickly pear. Do you remember this? Uh, he says, no matter how I toss the prickly pear, it always ends up spiky. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so he's like, if I shave my beard, he's like, I end up thinking, man, I'm really handsome. <laughs> and he goes, but if I let my beard grow out, he's like, I have this beautiful, luscious beard. Then everybody's in awe of my beard. And then I start to think to myself, I have a great beard. The point is that he kept, he was talking about all these different examples in life that, yes, it's always hard and challenging. Um, to cultivate anything while still cultivating the virtue and staying away from the areas that are vice. That's just a reality. Everybody struggles with it. So somebody said, Oh, are you, you know, you shouldn't lift weights because you're vain. It's like, okay, well then should you cultivate laziness? Right. I'm sure people have so, said that. Oh, well, father, yeah. you lift, you, you video yourself lifting weights. That that's vanity. And the thing is, is like, and nobody, this is the problem is, nobody knows the heart, right? right? You only know your own heart and everybody. And I think that it's impossible to say that there isn't anything in this world that we do that doesn't come with challenges, that doesn't come with temptations and struggles. It just does. That's the nature of the fallen world. Right. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So that, and that was the other thing too, is I think he was saying in the analogy, he said something like, if I fast too much, I end up looking ascetical. And then people think that I'm ascetical or something. Right. And he's like, but if I don't fast too much and I end up getting overweight, in which case I'm just being gluttonous, right? The problem is, is that however you look at it, the devil will always try to turn something into a temptation. We need to be a little bit more mature than that and saying, yes, if you lift weights, you're going to have temptations with vanity. What can you do to mitigate those temptations? Like you can dress modestly, you can dress appropriately, you can, right. you know what I mean? Right. You can do things that are not, that don't highlight it. Um, right. So, but yeah, I mean, I, again, to me, a lot of this stuff is very kind of low IQ. They don't, people <laughs> don't seem to really think through it and think like, okay, so you have, you have a sedentary job you're going to have hours in the week to do something. What are you going to do with that time? If you say, well, I'm going to do nothing with that time or I'm going to read. It's like, well, then you're going to end up fat. You're going to end up with low testosterone. Like that's going to happen. It's, it's not even, it's not even questionable. It's not even a debate. Like that's what happens. Right. So the world doesn't have an infinite amount of opportunities and possibilities for every single thing. It just has limited choices. And so you've got to choose to do something that's responsible with your time and energy that I don't know. I don't see why that's so hard. I love, there was somebody in the chat cause I pulled up the chat. There's somebody who said uh, something like we need to cultivate running eight hours a day. Like there's a tribe in Mexico that does it. Like what, what kind of insanity? <laughs> like, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> like I just, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know where people get this stuff from. Like we're going to turn into some kind of Mexican tribe where we're running around our subdivision every night for hours on end to stay in shape. Well, I mean, and, and something I've noticed too, first, talking, talking with some of the, the guys who want to get into fitness is like, this isn't our profession. So just because yeah. I go to the gym regularly and I've been very consistent over, over my life, um, this is my profession. So in, in regards to vanity, yeah, if I'm taking photos of myself with my shirt off all the time and, uh, you know, really glamorizing my physique or something like that, certainly you, you're you crossing a line into, into personal vanity. But if it's for me, it is very spiritual. The discipline, the stressing of my system, the doing something that's difficult, coming back stronger than I was before. To me, that's consistent with the ascetic process in our spiritual life as Orthodox Christians. We're doing something very similar. This one it has a, a different exterior. You're lifting weights or you're doing physical activity. But if you're doing it from the perspective, like there's a reason for it. It's it's for 
yeah. my family. It's for my community. It's for my parish. It's for me to be a better man in society. That's not exactly vain. And I, I just think that's so interesting that the vanity thing always comes up, but unless you're obsessed with it and constantly presenting it to other people, I don't see where this vain vanity thing, it's like they watch the gym cultures on TikTok, and you see all these guys posting their shirtless photos after a gym sesh. That's not, you don't have to do that to go work out and like build yourself up. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, the, I think the thing is, is sometimes people are just making excuses for being lazy. Yeah. You know, right. So they're just like, oh, well, I don't want to be vain. It's like, don't worry. You're, you won't end up being vain. You don't have good enough genetics. <laughs> and they're like, oh, you're, you're like, oh, you know, how dare you say that? You know, it's like, dude, it's like, you know, people are crazy. They're, they, they, they're trying to get a, like, create something that's a problem for them that has nothing to do with you. Right. Right. Yep. It, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with you. And the other thing is too, even when we get it, like this is why I talk about physicality in a general sense, because I don't care if people power lift or bodybuild or do whatever, or do jujitsu or do CrossFit. CrossFit's a little sus, but <laughs> anyways, but <clears throat> the point is, listen, the point is the main thing is if you're doing something that you enjoy doing, if you distill all of it down to just two principles, number one is you're an asset to your family when you're in shape. Yes. You can Back. protect them. You can provide for them. You can help them if something goes wrong. You And then number two, you can help your community, your church, your neighbors, the people around you, et cetera, et cetera. If you build, like just distill it down to those two facts, where is the downside? Like I can't, that's what I can't seem to comprehend is like, where is the downside in being able to physically protect your family and help them? in a time of crisis or just in necessities of life and where you're able to help other people around you. Right. Where, Never. where is the downside to that? It doesn't make any sense. Anyways, I'm, I can't even address it anymore. Yeah. There's a few different topics I want to mention that, that over on the live chat, I do want to make sure I don't miss this is, or we could just kiss. Uh, she sent in $5 before the stream started and said, can you shout out my husband, Cameron? <laughs> Howdy. Shout out to Cameron. God bless you, brother. Uh, give thanks to your wife. She has just made you public on the live stream. So uh, God bless good you. Life, That's a good or we life. could just kiss. And uh, her husband, Cameron, wish you guys nothing but the best. But um, this one, I, I, we've already answered it, but just so there's no confusion, is it vain if I do it, meaning the gym or working out to get better at baseball? Of course not. No, of course not. it's fun. It's a hobby. It's something right. good. It's and it's getting better at a sport and competition yeah. is not vain. That's that's where again we've been hitting in the, at the beginning of the stream, is that embracing competitiveness and competition is a good thing. When it becomes your sole identity, now we have a problem as an Orthodox Christian. Our our primary identity is followers of Christ and the church, right? But, but from there. Being come becoming competitive and skillful and good at something should be celebrated, absolutely celebrated. And the and the problem is never in winning. The problem is being a sore loser. If you're humble and if you're humble in victory, it's a virtue. It's a right. good thing to to show and to have. It's good to enjoy the competition, especially with your friends. If you set up a gym in your church's basement you guys will make so much exponential progress because everyone will be trying to get better than each other. Right. Whereas before, if you go to the gym by yourself, you're like, ah, I'm going to deadlift, whatever, you know, I don't know what you deadlift, but let's say you go, Oh, I'm going to deadlift 315 for eight reps. And it's like, you got somebody who pulls nine reps. You're like, I'm pulling 10. And right. the thing is, is that's that competition atmosphere. Uh, there's a guy named Greg Panora that I love on, on uh, Instagram. And he was a former power lifter with West side barbell. And he continually talks about the fact it wasn't West side barbell. He's like, it was the competition. That's what made us all better is that everybody was competing against each other. He said it was so competitive that going to a competition was less intense than just training at West side barbell because everyone was trying to win all the time. Well, right. what was the byproduct of that? Did they hate each other? Were they egomaniacs? 
No, they were very, very tightly bonded. They were tightly bonded to each other as a team, as competitors, as, you know, kind of brothers in this experience of going against each other. Uh, and they ultimately ended up being better than they ever would have been. So. Um, another uh, comment came in over on the Dono chat. If you guys want, if you have any questions or comments you'd like uh, Father Moses to answer, feel free to send them in on Streamlabs, Dono Chat, or YouTube. Uh, Turbo Diesel 5 throws in $10, says Twitter masculinity guru, but the only piece of advice he gives off is to log off. <laughs> we need this. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, what? he's saying that a, a Twitter masculinity guru, which there's tons of these guys, right? It, um, that the best piece of advice they could give is to tell their followers to log off the uh, internet. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's another thing we don't need to get into it, but I hate the whole fitness coach culture where you have these guys that are like 23 years old with an average to mediocre physique. And they're charging these, I, I don't even know who's buying their courses, but they're charging people for like diet plans and workout routines. And it's like, dude, why are you buying? I don't even understand why people would buy something from somebody like that. But there's so many of them. Uh, another question that came in from Orthodox Praxis uh, over on Dono Chat says, hey, DPH, I was wondering if you were still going to do a stream on working out during fasting seasons. Thank you for all that you do. And Father Moses, thank you. Uh, well, we could speak to that right now about um, we're getting ready to enter into Lent. Obviously, you have a competition coming up right before Lent starts. Um, what are some of the things you talk about with men at your parish or, or Orthodox athletes that are maintaining the fast through these periods? What advice do you have? Because this is always the big question. Well, how do I keep my gains during the fast or what, what do you eat during the fast? Yeah, so like number one thing to understand, and and this seems to be innate to how God created us, or innate to the fallen world, which is that there are naturally occurring cycles. Okay, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about going on a cycle. I am saying there are naturally occurring right. cycles throughout the year, such as seasons, and each season of life and each season of the year has, you could say, particular aspects that are more conducive to performance than others, right? This is why uh, people tend to not gain weight during the summer because the summer is hot. Like I have a garage gym and we have a fan in there and it's Texas. So it's, you know, summer is not a bulking season <laughs> in Texas. That's just the way that it is. It also seems that your body needs kind of up and down periods to develop itself in order to kind of peak properly, you can't be at level 10 all of the time. If you are, you, you end up, you know, burning out your CNS, your central nervous system, right. right? Like can't do it. People don't understand this, but even if I said, okay, my, my best deadlift is 650. That doesn't mean I could pull 650 today. I mean, it doesn't even mean I could pull 600 today. Why? Because it just depends on where I'm at in the training cycle. Right. Uh, your body has to go through these stages that are that are normal because that's how the body works. So one of the things that I say about Great Lent is if we think about it in terms of uh, and this is a good analogy, which is when people take PEDs, there's a misnomer. This is from Dave Tate over at Elite FTS. There's a misnomer that people when they take performance enhancing drugs can do so much more. And he's like, right. that's not the truth. He's like, when people take performance enhancing drugs, they're getting so much more activation out of their muscles and they're firing at such a higher level that they actually can do less. But the less that they do is more explosive or heavier weight, right? Because right. they're, they're able to recruit more muscle fibers right. than a normal person. So they can do more reps, but for a single set or two sets, right? So they may be able to do a single set of six, whereas if you weren't on PEDs, maybe you'd be doing two or three sets of three. But that one set of six is such a higher level of performance. Right. So likewise, if you think about it, you're getting less muscle recruitment during a normal time of year than in those peak times. Now, factor that down a notch that it's a fasting period. To me, the name of the game when it's fasting is just to do volume. Focus on doing volume. Focus, you're not going to have, 
your body is not performing at its best level. So the, so the thing would be like, oh, so you should do less. It's like, no, just do more, but less percentages. And this is, I think, where people don't understand weightlifting, that weightlifting is based off of percentages. So you have a max and you have an all-time max, and then your training cycle is a vari- is, is, is uh, variables of that max. So one week may be 75%, the next week may be 78%, the next week may be 81%. The next week, maybe 85, and then you start the cycle over at 78%, then 81, then 85, then 88, and then back down to 78, right? So you start to create these waves where you're trending upward in order to hit a peak goal or a peak performance level specifically for competition. Now, most people don't do this. What they do is they run their system ragged because they're like, I go to the gym every week and bench 225. Four, three, I work up to a set of three at 225. And then over six months, they never get stronger. Right. And it's like, why? Because you are maxing yourself out all the time. You right. have to work in this wave model. That's how the body works. Right. It's all the best power lifters train like this. Even the even the guys who do a conjugate system where they hit a one RM max, they're doing a different exercise every week so that the muscle recruitment that's utilized is different from week to week. Otherwise your body will fatigue out. You can't just hit maxes every week. The body doesn't work like that. Anything really sub five reps, five reps and under is primarily strength activation, meaning it's fast twitch muscle fibers and as hard as your body can go. So what you want to do during a fasting period, I hope this isn't too technical. No. But what you want to be doing during a fasting period, in my opinion is, more volume right you want to turn down trying to hit big numbers and turn up the volume and hit more right. people are often way under trained they think that they're you know you take a guy uh what's a good example is a good example is when guys look at, at guys who work out in prison right. it's like why can they work out in prison dude they're doing four hour workouts you're like oh that's not optimal it's like why are they so big then it's the human body has a natural tendency to adapt to whatever it is that you're doing. Right. If your job is to dig holes and the first day of work, you're going to be smashed. You're going to be smoked. The next day, you're probably going to be worse than the first day. And the third day is probably going to be worse than the first two days. And then your body's going to start to re- recoup, recuperate. And as it does, you're going to get to the point where you're digging holes every single day and you're able to co- and, and recruit all that muscle and you'll right. start to put on size. So same thing with uh, weightlifting during a fasting period. And I'm sorry if this is way too technical no. for people, but I would say focus on doing big volume work and just have fun and use way lower percentages because right. you're not going to get the same kind of recruitment. And people often think that it's, it's protein deficiency during the fast. My bro science says, I don't think that's true. I, I think that I really think it's actually that you're not getting all the animal fats that you normally get because um, you can get vegan protein powder uh, that will more or less hit um, your, your macro. Most your, yeah. Most of your macros, old school labs.com code priest Moses. <laughs> uh, I like old school labs. They have a good product. I do. I like their, I like their product. It does. And you can, you can use the code priest Moses and get 15% off. I, I do a lot of protein powders. Now, the bioavailability of vegan protein is not the same as the bioavailability of, say, whey right. or, or or meat. What does that bioavailability mean? It just means that your body isn't able to get as much out of the – you know, if you have 20 grams of protein from steak or 20 grams of protein from pea protein sources, which is basically most vegan proteins, the 20 grams of steak – are going to basically be better for your body. Your baby, your body's going to get more out of it than the other 20. Well, right. part of that is all of the amino acids and everything else that is in real food, including all of the fat. I would challenge anybody that when you get three or four weeks into the fast, the reason you start craving certain foods like steak and other things, you're not, nobody's craving chicken <laughs> fast. They're not, Right. Or like, oh, I really could go for some turkey. That tells you 
that when your when your body is thinking about what it wants and what's satiating, it really wants animal fat. Right. So that is what I would definitely focus on is make sure you're getting good uh, fatty sources because you need more fat. Don't worry if you get a little bit, uh, if you put on a little bit of fat during the fast, that's okay. That's not the end of the world. Make sure you're getting enough vegan protein uh, and then just focus on doing a lot of volume work. Yeah, the volume I think makes a lot of sense because you're going to have naturally have more glycogen in your system because you're going to be eating so many more carbohydrates. Bingo. And so if yeah. you have all that glycogen, you can see that maybe the Lent period is a pump session and you'll be able to, you know, increase your hypertrophy uh, yep. and these types of things by utilizing the fact you're going to be in a carbohydrate surplus. Probably you're going to have plenty of glycogen in your muscles and you can focus on hypertrophy and, and building up the muscle tissue during that period, as opposed to, to strength training. Yes. That is absolutely right. And you should be getting a good amount of decent. It, this is the one thing people talk about. You get lots of good carbs during the fast. Right. You got white rice. You got brown rice if you want to torture yourself. <laughs> uh, you got sourdough bread, right? You, you got all kinds of things that you you got pastas. Yeah. Uh, you, you can, you got great carb sources. P and people, this is a, a, a thing that people don't seem to understand is like, Carbs equal performance. They don't equal good physique. Right. There's a difference. If you want a 10% body fat, six, six, six pack and all that, don't eat carbs. If you want to perform like a man, eat a gang of carbs. Right. You will feel strong. You'll feel great. You'll have tons of energy. Uh, carbs are your friend. I, 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 it's funny because there was one time I tried doing a keto, which was, and I was doing it vegan keto, and trying to stick to it. And I was oh, probably vegan two weeks. keto. Oh my yeah. God. I was, like, I was like two weeks. Well, we were just fasting Wednesday and Friday. Right. So okay. the rest of the time I was eating like keto, I was probably two weeks into it. I couldn't make it through a workout, but every time, but I looked in the mirror and I was like, dude, I've, my body was like shredding, like shedding fat, like crazy. But I was like, there's no performance here. Why? Because you need carbs in order to lift heavy weights. In order to perform, you need carbohydrates. You can't, you can't perform on a keto diet or something like that. Um, and the people that are trying to do all carnivore diet and stuff, I just, I don't know how they're doing it. I just, it seems, it, it seems crazy to me. It seems like it's just going to totally throw off all your testosterone and hormone levels as well. I, people don't talk about that, but when your body gets low body fat percentage, that is not good for your testosterone. Your testosterone levels are best when you have a, a, a healthy, for a man, a healthy body fat of 15 to 25%. Right. Uh, and for women, it's higher. It's 20 to 30%. Right. People don't, again, I keep saying people don't talk about it, but I think people are unaware that, say, when a woman gets really lean or to a six pack or dips below that 20%, she becomes infertile. Right. Fact. That this is not how God created us. That women are not supposed to look like that. That's not a healthy way. It's not healthy for having children or for uh, or for getting pregnant. You can't right. get pregnant. That's that should be the immediate sign that that's not healthy. And guys, when they start getting sub ten percent body fat, they go and get blood work, and their testosterone levels are completely bombed out. Right. They are very low. The body needs to be fat, which is okay. It needs it needs some fat. That's okay. It's, that can it's cause a survival off. mechanism for the body. You know, historically speaking, it needed that extra weight and that extra fat source for energy because it never knew what was around the corner. Yeah. Now, now we, we were conditioned in the modern lifestyle where we have access to so much nutrition and food that, yeah, we can, you know, get, dip down to, especially the people who are following Instagram models and thinking that this is what fitness is oh. about that, Unless you're, you know, a guy and you're, you're finally down to 7% body fat, you've really never got fit. And it's like, no, um, you know, I typically stay around the 12 to 17% range. Um, I mean, let's, let's get something out of the way, which is all of the fitness influencers are on drugs. Yes. Another fact. So that's just a baseline. That's not, that's not even contestable. Right. If you're, if you look at the whole when people say, oh, they're fake natty, it, it's like you can't have a physique like there's there's a couple things that are going on. 
Number one is you have somebody who is literally the pinnacle of genetics. Right. That's a huge pinnacle thing. of genetics. You, that's not me. I mean, in some ways, can you fill that up for me? In some ways, I have some good genetics when it comes to strength. Okay. And specifically right. the bench press. But in terms of physique, those guys who have that level of physique are genetic freaks. They are the 1% of the top 1%. Now, in order to get to that level on top of it, they have to take performance enhancing drugs. It doesn't exist without it. The women that are super lean, that are fitness models and all these other things, they're all taking drugs. It, it, it's just a fact. This is, this is incontrovertible. Even, even celebrities, when people think, oh, the celebrity has this amazing physique, blah, 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 blah. It's not natural. Like, Right. I, I just, you have to realize what it's going to take in order to get that. Number one is you have to have the genetics. If you don't have the genetics, you're never going to get there. Number two is if you're not going to take all the drugs that it takes, you're not going to get there. These are people who are genetic freaks who also take the drugs. Right. So if, so, and you know, people, people, uh, don't want that type of life. It's not, this isn't healthy or normal counting calories, doing all this stuff. I mean, for some of these people, obviously it's their job. And so they, I guess they can normalize it because it's their job, but there's a lot of people that don't understand of all the people exercising. There's a very, 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 very small percentage that actually make a financial living at doing this sort of stuff. And right. of those people, they're on drugs. I remember year. I remember years ago. Um, uh, I I I can't give away too many details, but like I had a friend who was right when I started going to the gym, and he was repping four hundred five bench for like four reps or five reps. I'm like, man, this dude is so strong. He's like, he had twenty or twenty one inch arms. He was just all. And if you talk to me, he's like, oh, no, no, I'm natural, natural. Then I look back a few years later, I'm like, son of a gun, there's no way. There's no way he was natural. But it's like, why? It's like, because you know better. And then you start knowing guys and you start to see what guys are actually taking. And they tell you, you know, or you become friends with people and, and they open up about it. Right. And you realize, like, the, the guys who have 20-inch arms – or bigger than 20 inch arms, it's there's maybe a super outlier, like one in a billion, who can get that without taking any anabolics. It's right. not possible otherwise. Right. Yeah, that's the the whole phenomenon of the, like the liver king uh, <laughs> phenomenon, where you, where you you get on drugs, you get a you know a physique that's. Um, influenced by peds and then you shell products and say well it's because i'm taking my liver king pills you know make sure you get your your liver pills and, and you'll be able to be like me and so that's a huge problem i wanted to make another comment um can i, can I throw when, one more thing out yeah, there go ahead, go ahead. so this was years ago when i was pretty new to a lot of fitness stuff whatever this was the whole lance armstrong thing where mm -hmm. they're like no 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 he had cancer and he lost one of his testicles yeah. and now he's better than ever. Yeah. We, and I was like, this, I, I was like, I don't even know that much, but this, there's no way that this makes any sense. Like, <laughs> right. like you have 50% at best, 50% testosterone production against literally the greatest athletes in the world. But because you had cancer, you're mentally stronger than all of them. And so <laughs> mental, your mental strength is worth like, 400 test or something like right. additional 400 nanograms per deciliter of test. It just, it's just like, none of this makes sense. And when people ask this, or we talk about this, or I bring up or some, you know, we get conversing about this and they ask about um, sports and athletes and all this. It's like, look, they're the number one drug tested athlete in the world of all time was Lance Armstrong. Right. And they did the, best drug testing ever. I mean, guys in the NBA get drug tested like, like twice a year or something like that, maybe three times. And I think it's, I think some of these contracts even state that they can't test them more than that. 
Mm. Okay. Lance was getting tested before and after stages. I mean, he was getting, nobody has been drug tested more and he never failed a drug test. He, he had zero failed drug tests. The only reason he got popped was because his, his teammate basically ratted him out. Right. So if people think some guy on Instagram who's shredded 4% body fat and is talking about his diet plan and blah, 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 yeah. and is not drug tested at all. And is making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year from his fitness career and is claiming natty. I am sorry, but you are completely delusional. Like it does not exist. It doesn't work like that. Right. So just know what it is. I, that's the big thing is I, I feel like people don't know what this, what the fitness industry is or even what the movie star industry is. They had that, that was the best with, uh, the guy who plays uh, uh, Reacher, I can't remember mm. his name. The actor, I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. I, I know, but I don't know his name. Let me. See yeah, he's name. on. It's on. Uh, it, it's uh shoot. It's on the tip of my tongue. Anyways, um, the funniest thing is they did an interview with him, and he was basically like, "I don't know how I put on 30 pounds of muscle." Oh, <laughs> Alan Richson. Alan Richson. Yeah, he's like, I don't know. I don't know how I put on 30 pounds of muscle. Like. I've just been working out and eating and all this. Yeah. yeah. This Rice, off. broccoli, and chicken. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's like shredded, ph phenomenal physique, like, like amazing, amazing physique. He's like, I don't know how I did it. You know? It's like, yeah. I watched the uh, Alan Richson. He was in, uh, I think, uh, some sports broadcaster was interviewing him. And he's like, man, you look great. What, what's, you know, you must be on a tight diet. He's like, no, not really. Last night I had pizza and ice cream. And he's like, what? How do you look like that? He's like, well, I guess it's just genetics. It's just great <laughs> genetics. He's like, you know, he's like 35 or something with just the best genetics in the world and can put on 30 pounds of muscle in six months. Doesn't even know how he does it. It's just, it's a miracle. It's almost like he's taking a miracle drug or something. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, Yeah. And and just for people watching, just because you take PEDs doesn't mean you look great. That's another misconception is you still have to work your butt off for them to do the thing that you want them to do. And some people have a misconception like you just pop a pill or, or take TRT and all of a sudden you're going to you know look great. That's no, that's not how it works. And even and even among those people who take and I, and I, I mean, I know I had a friend who competed in bodybuilding and. I know how much he took. I mean, it would blow your mind if you just, it blew my mind. I could not believe how much he took. He was not even winning a regional show. Right. I don't even think he, I don't know if he won the show that he even competed in. And we're talking, he was taking like close to two grams a gear every single week. Like these are numbers that can alter small bodies. Horse. <laughs> this is, I mean, this, these are numbers that can alter your body's physiology for the rest of Forever, your life. Yeah. You can do real damage to yourself. This is not normal or safe. This is very dangerous. And yet he didn't look anything uh, like a top level competitor in any way, shape or form. That's people don't understand that when you look at like, let's say a Chris Bumstead or a Ronnie Coleman before they got on gear, I mean, they look, they look better than. Yeah, they still look phenomenal. Yeah, Ronnie like, Coleman before he even did PEDs crazy. was still a one percent physique. Crazy physique, and even his mom. I mean, you see the photos with his mom. Yes, and she's like flexing. His mom's got to have like fifteen inch arms or something. It's just like his mom. Like that type of genetics is so rarefied uh, that even the people who are taking stuff don't stand a chance at getting to that level. And most of what they're doing is blowing money and hurting their, their body long-term. Right. This And this is comes to a critique I've heard from some of the Orthodox women. And obviously not all women need to be working out. I think there's a priority for men to have a, a physical prowessness and presence, but there's a misconception talking with women that they think if they'll go to the gym or they do upper body exercises, they're going to look like a female bodybuilder. It's yeah. Like, they don't want to get too no, bulky. ladies, no, like getting a little bit of upper body strength is not going to make you look like a man at all. And if you want to have babies and children, it's only going to help you. Yeah. There's, there's a, 
well, there's the idea, and I don't know when it spread, but that women would get big or that they would get bulky. It's like you basically have no testosterone in your body. Right. Like high te- you know, this this is my wife, she just did her, her blood work. She did a really comprehensive blood panel because she's in her early 40s. And um the high end for women is like 60 nanograms per deciliter of testosterone. I mean. That would be so hypogonadal for a man. It's not even, I mean, it's not even, it's just, it's in, if a man had 60, (laughs) was it 60? I mean, you would be borderline not functional in so many different ways. Your testes almost are totally unfunctioning. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it'd be brutal. Like, yes, it would not be good. So when people think about this uh, and they, and they, uh, and they think that they're going to get huge or whatever else. It's, it's a complete opposite. It's a complete fallacy. What it is is that women have more, I think on average, more muscle fibers and whatnot in their hips and in their legs. Uh, and so they're worried about kind of getting bigger in their lower body uh, a lot of times if they exercise, but even then, well, now that's mostly what women want who are going to the gym. They're usually focusing, but I've, I've just spoken with women that like, Oh, well, I don't really train upper body cause I don't want to look manly. And it's like, well, you're going to the gym three times a week and you're only doing lower body. That's going to throw your body out of whack. You know, it's so funny is like, so my wife has like serious biceps and the thing is, is like, it's all from lifting babies. <laughs> So, <laughs> there you go. Like, I'm not kidding, but so you're going to work your upper body one way or the other. It's better to be in shape and be balanced and have a good, healthy, normal workout routine. What's the purpose of it in order to, you know, look great for the beach? No, the purpose right. is so that you're able to take care of your family and specifically your kids. Right. And you don't want to be out of shape for doing that or having children and this is a this is can be a real problem which is you know the hormones get out of whack in between babies at times and then women start to put on weight or not getting rid of the baby weight and so they end up unfortunately you know ending up overweight after they've had a few babies because they're not able to return to a healthy normal weight so uh in no way shape or form it's being overweight is very detrimental to your health, extremely detrimental to your health. Right. So, and bone density for women. That's the other one that they don't. Yeah, talk that's about. a big one. They get some. Right. Number, if you, if, I can't remember the age, but it's like 75 or 80 or something. If you break your hip, it's pretty much a death sentence. You will be dead within like two years. Uh, it's, it's, if you look at the statistics. Right. So, and bone density is one of the number one problems for women as they get older and you can build bone density in your youth, I think through middle age, and then basically you're stuck with whatever you have going into old age. So you definitely want to make sure that you take care of that and that you're limber and that you can play with your grandkids. All of this stuff is, is seeing the big picture, uh, which is you don't want to be morbidly obese at 55 trying to lose weight, which is super difficult to do. Because everything genetically, age-wise, your joints is against you. Right. And then trying to kind of maximize your last years while you can't travel or do other things because you're not in shape. Right. Well, I got a few other topics I want to run by you. We had uh, another super chat came in for $5. Robo Lamb says, late to the stream, but wanted to support. The guy saying we need to be ascetical are missing the point that the saints were tough as nails, physically and spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. Great point, Robo Lamb. And in regards to the vanity thing, this was a comment I wanted to make earlier. And it it's a point that I think we touched on in the last stream that we did together is you can't even be vain if you have nothing to be vain about. And we were talking about mercy as... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we were talking about mercy in our last conversation and how uh, a, a king or an emperor or a, a man of power back in the day, for him to be merciful insinuates that he has the capacity to not have mercy on somebody. Mm. And we were talking, I think we mentioned about violence and that you, you know, you want to be able, the goal is not to be violent at all. Mm. But if something were to pop off, you're able to be present 
and defend oneself. And so the, the vanity thing and the humility thing, I think it's so ironic because many of the people that want to label any orthodox guy that is into sports or physical fitness as vain, yet it doesn't insinuate vanity. And yet at the same time, they lack humility by promoting their piety signaling. Mm. And um, to be vain, you know, it first insinuates that they have something to be vain about that you don't. And, and it's like, it gets back to that mercy component. It's like, well, you have to be to, to really demonstrate mercy to somebody. You have to have the option not to, you know, the homeless person on the street, you have the option to walk over them or not give them money, but to show mercy is the virtue. And so it's almost virtuous to build ourselves up and then still dress modestly and not, you know, be so flamboyant with whatever we develop. So I just wanted to make that point. This was from a probably 30 minutes ago, but that the whole vanity thing, you know, it, it's almost more spiritually virtuous to have something to be vain about and not be vain than to have very little and be overly vain. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's I, and, and back to what we were talking about earlier. There's a reason. I mean, there's concepts within marriage that they're not secular concepts. They're just reality. So when we talk about men are primarily providers and protectors, that's not a secular concept. No. That's just a reality of living in the fallen world. Right. Well, you're going to be a man with a children, with, with a wife, and you're, and you're going to live in this world. You need to be able to provide for them. That just is common right. sense. And ideally, you also need to protect them. I, I, one thing that people don't, talk about or touch on maybe because it's a sensitive issue is women today not being very attracted to the men that they've cultivated. Yeah. Well, but let's get into that. That's something I've yeah. talked about a lot because some of the, I, again, I don't know if you've been following, like there's the red pill. I'm sure you're aware of the manosphere. Oh. And then there's been emerging the Christ pill. And it's mostly been a Protestant, sometimes Catholic phenomenon where they basically are telling these young guys, you know, you make your altar call, you're at, you're now at your parish and now you can just go to church and you'll find your happy ever after Christian wife. And I've been highlighting that that's naive because the same problem with general secular dating dynamics that 70% of the men are deemed unattractive to 80% of the women. Well, what do we do with that? Because the, the, the people that historically would get together the man's still interested. The women are no longer interested. And that's still even within the Orthodox Church. That's still within uh, the church itself that there's still a dating problem and that women are still not finding the average man attractive. Well, in a, one of the things I would say is that this is not a historical reality necessarily. If well, you look no. at old black and white videos, well, a couple things. And I'm this is going to... People may not like what I'm going to say. So I'll preface it by saying uh -oh, here this we is go. my opinion and you can do with it whatever you like. <laughs> Back in the 70s, if you look at videos from people exercising in the 70s, they were all in shape. All, I mean, being out of shape and overweight, there, there's a direct correlation to attractiveness and how much you weigh. There are numerous examples of men who were not attractive and we've all seen the transformation videos and all they did was lose weight. And when they lost the weight out of their face, they started to develop a jawline. They looked handsome. They were good looking guys. In fact, there's those, you know, pictures of women who, who transformation and they lost weight. And it's like, what happened? They just lost weight. Right. So a lot of attractiveness, I don't think actually has to do with some mysterious component as much as when you're physically fit, it highlights the features of your face in a more complimentary way. So looking at old black and white videos of people in the 70s and, and even into the 80s, there was minimal to no television. Right. Everyone exercised. The food was way more nutritious. True. The food was not processed. People did not have the phytoestrogens that they do today. People were not as sedentary as they are today. 
And I'll be honest, there was a component of culture that it was frowned upon to be overweight. Right. And it was honestly socially uh, a bit of a social stigma. So I said, people are not going to like this. I grew up in the 90s and I can tell you it was like that even in the 90s. If you had, I mean, we, I mean, we didn't have cell phones. We really didn't even have the internet. So we didn't really have computers. We had some video games, but even at the time, like it just seemed like nobody's, nobody's parents would let you play six hours of video games. Right. That was unheard of. Right. You would have to leave the house and go do something physical. And so, and if you had a friend, I'm sorry, this is the reality, but if you had a friend who was out of shape or fat or whatever else, you made fun of them. And <laughs> right. that was part of the social dynamic was like, hey, get it together. The reality was, is that there were, on average, I think a lot of people were kind of, honestly, forgive me, but better looking during that time. Absolutely. But I mean, the, the beach photos from were, then. But pe purely because people were active. They were active. They didn't eat as much. They didn't eat as much processed food and they didn't spend as much time sitting around. Right. So I think when we look at today and we see women who are saying, hey, men are not attractive. It's there are two reasons for that. One is that men are physically not in the same condition that they used to be in. True. And then second of all, mentally, men today are just much weaker than they used to be. Right. And they don't seem to have a clear understanding about what it means to be a man or what is masculine. There right. seems to be a lot of um, uh, gray area. Hey, Bob, I'm on the computer. You got to go out and close the door, okay? Close the door, please. Did you hear me? Close the door, please. Thank you. Can you close it? Thank you. There's a little guy. <laughs> um, so... I, that's a big, that's a big component. Yep. I, the things that were seen or deemed masculine that were just normal, even in my youth, again, in the nineties are men today don't seem to understand even what is masculine. It, the other part of it is, and this is going to be, you can, this will be another one to light people up. There we go. Shots fired. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> The type of man that women describe today that they want is not the type of man that they're actually attracted to. Yes, huge. And so I remember my wife telling me recently there was some mothering group that she was on or something. And this woman said, I have a great husband. He does everything. He cleans the house. He does dishes. He takes care of the kids. And she's like, I'm having a crisis. I am just not attracted to him. Right. And so there's seen, and, and that doesn't mean that men can't do dishes. Doesn't mean that men can't carry. Not, I, mean, I carry my baby pretty much every day in the carrier for my wife. Well, I even, I even, uh, for another thumbnail, I, I had a photo of you with the, the baby on the chest. <laughs> I was going to use. I mean, I spend time almost every day carrying that baby, like at least sometimes between one and three hours a day. So it's not about helping out your wife it's part of a, a deeper crisis that that men have tried to create themselves in women's image. So, so women have said, this is what we want a man to be. We right. want him to be sensitive. We want him to talk to us about our fe their feelings. We want them to open up to us. Basically we want men who are more feminized. Right. And then when a man does that, they're like, Ooh, that's, the, that's weird. That's right. disgusting. So like they've, They've told men that this is what they want. And men have become convinced that this is what women want. And so they're starting to do this behavior. And then it's completely backfiring because no woman wants to be married to another chick. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 I, like, and you talked to seriously. Like, you seriously. Talk to, I was on yeah. Twitter recently. This woman had a whole post about how men should be into small talk and doing all this stuff and, and how men should want to do this chitty chatty stuff. And I was like, honey, it sounds like you want to be married to a woman. That's <laughs> not a man. I don't want to talk to my wife about chitty chatty. I, I, I don't, I'm not interested. That's it's I'm not, I'm not hardwired. I don't call other men and do this. <laughs> right. Exactly. How we are as men. 
in the past, women understood and let men be men. And the women in, 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 in bygone eras were much wiser than women today. Yeah. Women in the past utilized and leveraged men's strengths for their benefit. Right. Women today have tried to feminize men and then the men can't seem to do anything or accomplish anything. And then they're and then they're upset because now they've got basically a stay-at-home wife or a, a wife, you know, a second wife around the house and they're wondering where the leadership and the direction is and the and the emotional stability. Again, there's a reason that men are circumspect with their emotions. Right. And it isn't because we don't have emotions. We do. We have two emotions. We're happy or we're angry. That's it. Uh, <laughs> that's where we primarily exist. We don't have 30 different emotions. We don't label them. We don't talk about them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Right. We just don't. That's not how we are as men. We're, exactly. We're more simplistic. But part of that is that men were emotionally stable for women. That's one of the things that women, women have a harder time with their emotions than men do. They have more thoughts. They have more feelings. It's more intense for them. And I'm very sympathetic to that. It's they, their, their biochemistry is wildly different than ours. I, I, I can't even begin to get into, even if you look at the levels of estrogen that a woman experiences compared to a man, it is astronomical. Right. It's astronomical. There's a reason that they're like that. And it's beautiful. It's who they are. It's not, there's nothing negative or bad about that. But what they want is a man to rely on. Right. They want a man to bring the emotional stability. Well, part of that means that if I'm going to be emotionally stable, I have to cut off emotions that don't help me reach my goal. Meaning if my goal is to remain emotionally stable, I have to be a little more cutthroat with myself and I can't just indulge every whim and fantasy and every fleeting feeling that comes into my heart. Right. Because if I do that, I'm going to be emotionally unstable. Well, right. guess what? When I'm emotionally unstable, how does that make my wife feel? Now the wife who's looking for the husband to be emotionally stable is like, who's running the ship? Who's balancing? Who's steering the ship? Are we all just, you know, being given over to our emotions and, 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 um, you know, is there instability here? If right. you want to see a woman who's, who has real kind of insecurities and, 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 and kind of some neurotic tendencies, a lot of times it's a husband who's not emotionally stable because it makes them feel insecure about, about the dynamics of life. A man is supposed to bring emotional stability to life and to sail the ship through the sea of all the torments that you go through. And those torments rock you as a man and they're hard. Right. And your job is not to stuff your emotions per se. It's to prioritize what emotions you're going to deal with and which ones you're not going to deal with. But right. you're I'm in, and in, in, in you can, see this however you want, but my wife is not my friend. I don't rely on my wife to help me deal with my emotions. That's not the dynamic that I have created in my marriage. My dynamic in my marriage and in my family is that everyone can rely on me and I rely on none of them. So I am a hundred percent given over to my task. I love that. Care of and stabilizing them. Now, I when that. I feel unstable, which happens because I'm human. When I have neurotic thoughts or when I have fears or insecurities, that happens to me because I am human. I get on the phone with my spiritual father. I get on the phone with a mentor, an older man who's a father figure to me. Right. I talk about them. I don't pretend like they don't exist. I don't just stuff them down. And I think that's where people miss and kind of fall off the path on either side. One side is, oh, I've got to tell everybody how I'm feeling and doing and and be vulnerable and all this. That's not supposed to be your normal. And right. the other side is, oh, I've got to stuff it all down as if it doesn't exist. That's not normal either. What I've got to do is process my emotions in a healthy way 
that is beneficial for my family so that I can remain stable. Right. I need to be lifted up. I go to another man. I don't go to my wife to lift me up. That's not the dynamic. And so when women have kind of created this dynamic where they want men to be on that level and to be vulnerable with them and to be sensitive, well, when men do that, it makes them feel insecure. It's like, well, if I'm feeling insecure and now he's feeling insecure and we're both uncertain and we're both, you know, having troubles emotionally, where's the stability at in this marriage? Right. So anyways. No, I I, I had a few points I wanted to make on that. Uh, You know, there's videos online of all these dating shows. And there's so many examples of women talking about how once their boyfriends began to cry or they had a hard day and then they cried in front of them, how all of a sudden they lost all attraction to them or they were repulsed by it. I mean, one woman was. I think this was on Joe Rogan. She was she was even so far that she was talking about how a man was like harassing her and her boyfriend and her boyfriend went to confront him and got knocked out. And she was saying how she like immediately had like a response where she felt a lack of attraction towards him in the days afterwards after seeing him get knocked out and not really know how to fight or, or deal with the conflict. But I wanted to make a point. You're talking about women and i i know some of the men watching were like father moses is not go ahead we talk on that one thing because i want to make something clear i a hundred percent have cried in front of my wife like many many times like not like once or twice i've been married 22 years i've cried in front of my wife many times but i don't cry about my feelings in front of my wife and there's a distinction and it's in the writings of saint sophronia of essex he said we need to weep over our he said he actually says we would do well to learn from the British because they don't cry over their circumstances, but we Orthodox cry over our sins. Mm. Okay. So if there is something, I, I had a homily recently and I was preaching on the new martyrs and confessors of Russia. And like every time I preach on them or celebrate them, like it busts me up. I cry when I celebrate them because the struggle that they endured was so manful and so absolutely brutal for their families to be torn apart by the secret police and the gulags and the murders, it hits me to the core. I have no shame in crying over that because it's powerful. It's the most powerful Christian witness. I, I know that for <laughs> my, my wife cooked dinner for us one time. She cooked dinner, set everything else up, everything, and it was like spectacular. And I had this moment where I like looked at our life and what she's created for us. And I like just embraced her and she could see I was like teary eyed because I was so enamored by what she did. And I'm so in love with her. And and I'm like, my wife has given me all of this. My wife has given me these beautiful sons, this family life, this meal, all because of her sacrificialness. I have no problem crying in front of my wife about something that is powerful or emotional. Somebody in the parish, something tragic happens to them. Uh, She'll see me, we'll pray, and and she'll see me cry. Why? Because it's normal. That's what we do. We weep with those who are weeping. When real tragedy strikes and something happens to somebody, it's okay. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing, there's no lack of masculinity there. The saints wept over their sins every day they wept over the the state of the world right. what they didn't do was weep over themselves yes. and they didn't have a pity party and and that's the main difference i think that is not nuanced is that there are there are men who are weeping over themselves and their circumstances in life which just it really comes across as being just kind of self-indulgent and a bit pathetic Right. And that was the point I was making with the one example I saw is that the man started crying because he felt like he was having such a hard day. Mm -hmm. But as you're highlighting, um, uh, a stoic disposition doesn't mean that you reject or neglect all emotion. That is not human and that's not even masculine. And so as you're highlighting, there's a the difference is you weeping over your feelings or you know, exterior difficulties as opposed to genuine 
problems and sympathies with people, our sin, right. like that, that it's a different level of understanding of, of problems. But, you know, if a man is upset because, you know, people were teasing him at work and he comes home and cries, yeah. like there's a problem there. Well, the thing is, is like, that's what a boy does. Right. And we have a society of boys, not men. And so when a woman, it's normal, it's normal if my kid gets bullied or something happens, right? And then they have an emotional meltdown because right. they're boys. I'm not proud of them for it. I just realize that's where they're at emotionally and developmentally. And I encourage them, you know, as you get older, you got to learn how to not react to this stuff. Right. But that's what boys do. But yeah, when a, when a man does it, when a boy does it, a woman wants to... uh uh, uh, comfort them, right, and and give them some love. But when a man does it, boy, she is repulsed, right? Like, she is repulsed. And and the thing is, is that when women lose that attraction for their husbands, so often it doesn't have to do with uh, some kind of um, uh, just like one thing. It's it's it, it, we've lost the sense of masculine energy. Yeah. There's a masculine presence. Like there's certain guys that you're around, you know what I'm saying? And you get the sense like this is a man, this guy. And it's not, it's how they carry themselves. It's how they look. It's how they, it's, 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 you just know this is a man. This feels like a man when I'm around him. If I'm around a woman and she's like a Uber mother and she's like taking care of her kids and she's da 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 and she loves being a mom. Like to me, that is the most beautiful, wonderful feminine energy. Right. Agreed. It's, it's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. It's giving, it's loving, it's nurturing. There's it's it's so beautiful. But if you're around a woman who's bossy and telling people what to do and thinks high of herself, no. oh my goodness, you're like, ugh, like I just like, yeah, just ugh, like come on, get over yourself. Like, it's just it's not attractive. It, it's not attractive. The, 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 probably the most manliest man that I've ever known in my life, everything, almost everything that he did was for other people. He was constantly, even, even if he talked about his bank account, he was like, God has entrusted this money for me to take care of other people. He was constantly providing for people around him, like everyone around him. He and and not in a handout way, right. in a real way that he was encouraging people and building them up and building up other guys. And he was a servant. He was a servant leader. Right. When you see a man like that with that type of energy, because in this world, the distorted masculine energy is like it takes. Right. It makes itself the object. And it, and it valorizes the thing that it takes. So yeah. I made money through cam, you know, cam site. So I show you my Bugatti and I show right. you my wealth and I show you the things that I've taken and been able to present. But that's, oh. that's not what real masculinity is. About. No, real masculinity is servant leadership. Yeah. I mean, right. Andrew Tate is like the pinnacle of, 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 of demonic energy. That's demonic energy. That's, that's not masculine energy. Uh, it that energy destroys other people for its own profit. A man does not destroy other people for his own profit. Right. That's not what he does. He 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 is entrusted by God with a power and authority, but that power and authority is to is to enable and build up the people around him and make their lives better. That's what he's doing, uh, which is a completely a completely different dynamic. Right. Um, in relation to that, I wanted to make a comment that men also, we tease each other to try to sift out the boys, right? So if you're in a group of men or you're at the gym, it is very, everybody is poking fun at everybody to see who has the comebacks, how you handle it. And if you get emotionally affected by teasing from men, you've already sort of lost um, because that's, that's in a way how we show affection. Yeah. Um, but uh, I wanted to make another point about the Real. problems with some of the dating dynamics. You're speaking about women and the, what they say they want is very different from what they actually want. I agree yeah. with that. 
And I wanted to uh, make an additional point about birth control and how we've seen that birth control alters the hormones of women. And there's been multiple Absolutely. cases where the men that a woman gets with while on birth control, they yeah. tend to select um, more feminized men. But then when they come off of it, they find that they're no longer attracted because now their hormones are able to engage with the, the pheromones of men that have higher testosterone. Uh, these things are blocked when they're on birth control. And then all of a sudden now they want it like a, a, a more conservative testosterone filled guy when the guy that they have said they want to be with or even had a child. I saw that there was an article about multiple women on birth control. Then they have a child and then they find that they're no longer attracted at all to the man that they've been with. Well, it's, it's, a, it's the same thing with the with being clean shaven, right? So men who look safe, one of the aspects of having low testosterone is that you can't grow a full beard. Now, there's a genetic component for some people with that. But typically, when a man cannot grow a full beard, it's because he has low testosterone. That's just a biological fact. You can look it up on right. the Internet. Okay. So women in our society have liked men that look safer and are clean shaven and are basically better domesticated. Right. Uh, they want that because they're on the hormones, because they're on the birth control. Not only that, you have to very you have to be very careful because that there is so much birth control in our country that it's in the water supply as well. Yeah. And and they had that whole thing recently about it being in cereals. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Cereals in in uh, General Mills, right? And so that's why. It, and this is a fascinating study. I think it was out of Great Britain, but basically, what it was was they uh, took the women off of the birth control and then showed them all the pictures. So the guy who looked kind of dirty and rugged when they were on birth control, like untamed, when they came off of the birth control and it was time to have babies, they were like, "That's who I want to mate with." Right. Like that's the guy. It's like, why? Because you want somebody who is physically capable, makes you feel safe and has a strong presence. So right. yes, absolutely. This has shaped our culture along with, again, not growing facial hair and, 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 and kind of soft and domesticated. It's, it's what it is, is it's soft and domesticated and docile men. Right. And a man, a real man is not soft and domesticated. Right. He just never is. He just, that's just, it's, it goes against everything inside of us to become kind of soft and, and, and weak and easy and, 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 and whatnot it's created. It creates a kind of weakness and a passivity that right. is not healthy or normal for men. Right. Um, and, and I've highlighted, there's a term in biology called neoteny which is mm -hmm. about the retention of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. And so if you take a pig, for example, and you put it in a pen, it'll have no tusk and it'll have pink skin and less hair. If you take, if you allow that same pig to run wild, it begins to grow tusk, its skin gets thicker, it gets darker and it grows more hair. And it shows that environments can dictate like phenotype uh, display. So, so your genetic expression is changed by the environment you're in. And I've highlighted that the feminization, I think, is tied towards a neoteny process where men are retaining juvenile characteristics into adulthood, mm. like Funko Pops and and you know toys and Star Wars, Wars. And Star Wars oh, toys. And stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is a retention of juvenile characteristics <laughs> into adulthood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like I just told my boys the other day, we were driving, and I was like, "Listen, boys, I'm like, I know you guys like Star Wars, okay." I personally can't stand Star Wars. I'm like, I know you guys like Star Wars. I was like, don't you ever grow up and be men that put Star Wars stickers on your cars, though? <laughs> they were like, what do you mean, Dad? Of course we're going to put Star Wars stickers on our cars. And I'm like, no. I'm like, when you're a boy, because we were driving by somebody and they had all these Star Wars stickers on their car. And I was like, <laughs> don't ever do this. <laughs> I'm like, when you're a boy, it's fine to do boyish things. But when you become a man, like St. Paul says, you put you put boyish things behind you right and you talked earlier too which is a good point to circle back on which is and it relates to this in terms of being in a masculine environment if somebody comes and works out with me and we and we poke them a little bit a really quick you see the person's ego so it's interesting because 
you would think it's the opposite, right? You would think right. that, like, oh, it's the it's the it, it's the humble guy who doesn't joke around or poke, and that's not true. The the guys that are egomaniacs, if you start poking them or say something about what they're doing or say something provocative, they get so bent out of shape. They they can't take it because right. in their mind, they are the best. They're this, they're that, they're whatever. And, and so the sifting process, right, is you get rid of your ego by being around other men who tell you don't have an ego. Right. Do your work, work hard, don't have an ego. And you learn to check yourself. I remember, I remember this like it was yesterday. I was on a job site with a guy when I was a plumber and he was like, he was over six foot tall. He was a biker and he was a framer, dude, just jack forearms, <laughs> wiry, just big, just rode Harleys and was, it was a gnarly dude. And I was like, you know, five foot six, 140 pounds or something. And I, dude, I made some comment. I ran my mouth a little bit. And I remember he looked at me and he was like, and he said, he said, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And I was like, I was like, I was like, I was like legit. I was like, at the time I was like, yeah, I probably shouldn't run my mouth. Yeah. But what did that do? That humbled me. It wasn't a bad thing. He wasn't he wasn't beating me up. He wasn't bullying me. He was checking me like a man checks a boy and right. says, "Listen, you're a boy, I'm a man, and we're not on the same level and you need to check yourself for a minute." The problem is with a lot of western men and especially with a lot of people coming from Protestantism is, "Oh, we're all the same. We're all on the same page. We're all equal, blah, blah, blah. No, we're not. There's no, a hierarchy. Not. The hierarchy is not meant to push you down or step on you. Right. The hierarchy is your friend as long as you're humble. Right. Right. It's it's when you come to the church and you've watched a few podcasts and read a couple books and think that you know something about orthodoxy. The reason the priest checks you is be, not because he's afraid or intimidated by you. Like these, these guys on Twitter, just like, they just have no education even. No. And they have tons of opinions on everything, every pastoral issue, everything that's going on in the church. And it's like, no, don't, you need to stop. Like you're not married. You, you, you don't have children. You're not a man. And a lot of times you don't even look like a man. So just, <laughs> that, that's true. Just, so just cut it out. Earn yeah. No They'll have a cartoon yeah. anime of a female on their profile picker, yeah, picture just, and just, Twitter. And they're talking about how, you know, some some cr criticism of some man in the church or something. It's ridiculous. Well, and you need to you need to earn your place. Right. And you earn your place through service, through being humble, through showing up. There's no bishop that didn't serve a thousand services or more before you know they were ever ordained right so these men when you look at a bishop even and you go oh this bishop or the, there needs to be a baseline of respect for the bishops especially who were like monastics that were cell attendants they have put in some serious amounts of work serious amounts of dedication and serious amounts of sacrificial living that people don't see or even understand right. and so a good bishop is a solid example of somebody who has been absolutely sacrificial in their time and their energy and so you're you're deferential to them not out of some kind of weird dynamic where you're trying to suck up to them or some other weird thing in a normal healthy male dynamic you realize hey there are people that are my superiors Right. And they're my superiors because they've put in the work and they've earned that position. And God has also blessed and graced them with it. Right. That is a healthy, normal thing to do, to come into the church and think that, you know, more than the priests and know more than everybody around you because you spent six months reading the church fathers is, is a, a huge, huge problem. Right. And people thinking, well, I've studied the Bible for five years. 
And, and the sad part is a lot of times when they finally are in the church for a handful of years, they realize, you know, I really didn't know anything when I was coming into the church. Exactly. I thought I knew something because I was all puffed up. And I thought that I knew something because I was Protestant for X amount of years or because I used to be a pastor or whatever else. And I came to realize I really didn't know anything. And, and that type of humility is good and healthy and a good male environment make sure that we have that established because it's important for us to be humble. You know, we're not subservient. We're not butt kissers. We're not, uh, we don't placate people. We don't, I don't need anybody to puff me up or whatever that none of that is, is masculine, healthy environment. We have a good sense of self. And when we understand ourselves, we also understand the position of those around us and we show due respect. Right. And following on that, I had another comment, but following on that, again, just like the comment we saw in the live chat earlier about uh, submitting to hierarchy, hierarchies are not evil. Hierarchies, again, whether it be the hierarchy of the church or the hierarchy of the gym or the hierarchy of the business world, these are earned through competition. But like you said, you have to earn your place in the hierarchy. And that's something to be embraced as a man, not something to shy away from or insinuate that every hierarchy in the world is somehow satanic if it's not the church. Um, that's just not how men function. But the other point I wanted to make in regards to criticisms with the dating dynamic, the first one was the birth control. The second one is elevated expectation. So we're talking about women not finding the average man attractive and all the points that you mentioned, I would totally agree with, but also, and we don't need to belabor this or talk much about it. Maybe if you have a comment or something, but because of social media, I, I multiple papers have been written about this, but women can garner so much more attention now through posting photos and their social media accounts that men that they might be able to hook up with or sleep with aren't the same men that they're actually capable of marrying. And so the average woman feels like she's above the average man who historically, those were the people they would get married and have children. But because of promiscuous sexual experience, because of the garnering of attention through social media, yeah. the average woman thinks that she deserves, you know, a much higher caliber man. And I don't mean to put numbers, anything on people, but you get the point. And much sociological data has showed that this is a fact. And so women have such higher expectations. They, th they say they don't want a traditional man, but then when you say, well, what do you want? Well, he needs to make this amount of money and he needs, so they still want a traditional man, but they're not traditional women. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, one, one of the dynamics that we, that we, that I've noticed and just in my own life, right. Which is I dated my wife when she was 18. My wife was very good looking. Um, and, we got married when we were really young because we had the same goals and same desire for Christ. It was very, we had, we are very different personality wise opposite end of the universe, but we were very harmonious in our vision. What's interesting today is that, is that um, people don't see the long game. So the long game is, and this is, this is totally factual men tend not to make money, real money until their early thirties or into their forties. The reason for that is, is that social dynamic of having enough experience and maturity to be trusted in elevated positions of authority. And so it's beneficial. The irony is, is that today, um, women invest in men in their twenties that won't marry them. So by the time that they're in their 30s or so, when they're not, I forgive me, but not as desirable because this is a reality. Fact. Um, the same men who they rejected, who are now in their 30s, who are making money because they've moved along in their career and their maturity, are now it now dating women that are younger. So right. if you really want the best dynamic, it's to get married young. You marry someone young with the potentiality and you both basically are making an investment. The the wife is making an investment in the husband because she's like, hey, when I get older and I'm not as attractive as I am now, you're not going to ditch me for somebody else. Right. And the husband makes an investment and says, hey, 
I'm going to do my best to provide for you, even though I can't do it yet. Right. And so that's really the right dynamic, which is you invest early on and in your early 20s, ideally, so that you're able to cultivate that together. Because that's 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 the problem with the people who are uh, in these dynamics that are not Christian. They're shocked that women are getting traded out for newer, younger models. And it's like, but they also created that dynamic. Exactly. They married, they didn't marry somebody age appropriate. They married somebody who was older or they married somebody because of status or because of wealth. And then they're shocked that that same dynamic doesn't work in their favor. Right. Um, my well, wife, you look, you look at the culture of somebody like Madonna in their sixties and they're getting all this plastic surgery to look younger We've had it. We, we live in a culture where women are terrified by looking their age. And so the same women in their 30s, 40s and now 50s that are getting plastic surgery to look like they're in their 20s are upset because men still prefer to date women in their 20s for reproductive purposes and yet don't see the hypocrisy that they're doing everything they possibly can to look like the thing that they're no longer are. Yeah. And I mean, that's a. I mean, that's I mean, that's just yeah. I mean, there's a saying and it's brutal, but there's, there's a reason they say it, which is men age like wine and women age like milk. Like that's, that's not a fun saying, but it's there for a reason because I, but the, but the one caveat that I would say on that is St. Paul says a woman will age and she ages according to the grace of the Holy spirit, basically. He's like, don't let your glory be internal. Let your like, don't let your glory be external, but let your glory be internal. Mm -hmm. And 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 one of the weird, just anecdotally, things that I've seen with godly men who have married women that that as they got older, or even I could say in my own life, which is, I'm more attracted to my wife now, right? She's in her forties than I was when we because my connection and my bonding to her is so much, it's on such a deeper level. My, my gratitude, all of the things that I see attractive about her are so much more pronounced right. than when I was in my early twenties. And in the attraction obviously was on a more superficial level and didn't have all the history, right? Like my wife has been with me through a lot of years where we didn't have much, where we've struggled along together but that bonding is what creates that 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 real tight relationship that unfortunately in our society is not very prevalent right so yeah and the and that's another great point that you're making about the attraction for your wife because of the commitments and then the family and everything that she's been able to provide your the depth of intimacy and love and attraction grows more and the yeah. same women that are aging and then trying to look younger aren't actually providing any of those things that give them qualities for a man to become more attracted to them while they age. Well, and, and somebody in the comments said something, they said, uh, women he said be, being on the scene partying ages women more than men. When you look into the eyes of a woman who has been living, uh, uh, whatever promiscuously or whatever else they have very dead eyes. They don't shine. They don't sparkle. They don't have light. When a woman, when you look at a woman who has um, been staring at babies, her eyes sparkle. They shine. They're full of light. They 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 are healthy and they're natural. My wife is my wife has not worn makeup in 22 years of marriage. She never wore makeup when we were dating. She still doesn't wear makeup. Uh, does she have more wrinkles now? Yeah, objectively she does. That's true. But I mean, she's, I mean, I'm enamored with her. That's all mm -hmm. that matters. Right. Uh, people forget too, that I think, I do think that things like makeup are, are, are not healthy for the skin. And I, and in fact, a lot of times, this is an interesting thing too, which is if you meet Russian women, a lot of times who are in their thirties, late thirties or forties, or they don't look their age, but Russian women typically don't wear a bunch of makeup true and and so even that can age a woman when she's trying to put on the mask and trying to turn back time there's a kind of a, a treachery in our culture of when you try to look 
younger or you turn back the clock or you try to create or make something happen, it actually backfires on you. In fact, and you know this from weightlifting, there will be guys who get on tons of gear, get all big, and they'll be in their mid-20s, and they look like they're in their mid-30s. Yeah, that, I've seen that. Tons of times. Tons of There was a guy recently who was lifting, and I was like, man, he's really doing it his age. I was like, how old are you? And he's like, 37. And I was like, I would have thought he was like 45. <laughs> <laughs> like he just looked like 10 years older. And uh, why? Because when you're trying to turn back the clock, you know, in a false way, there's something that it does to you, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I totally agree with that. Um, we got a couple more super chats and then I'll let you get out of here. I really appreciate your time and, and staying around with us to answer some questions. Heidi, uh, one of our beloved ortho sisters here in the live chat throws in a generous $30 and says, thank you. Your conversation brings me hope. Glory to God. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. Really appreciate all your support. And uh, Dwell or Dwell uh, throws in ten dollars and says, "Great stream beyond the ability to protect one's family. Lifting builds an incredible amount of self discipline." Father, do you think this discipline cultivated in the gym can carry over to your spiritual life? Yeah, I mean, disciplined people do disciplined things. <laughs> there you go. Right. Yeah. 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 So I mean, if, if you th the thing is, is that everybody has a voice in their brain that tells them to to do things they shouldn't be doing, and when you go to the gym, you are learning to actively combat that voice and to ignore it. So the same thing happens when it's time to pray or do other things. You just learn how to not listen to that voice. I'll be honest with you, Pat. Patrick, as, as a priest, so many times with people, I'm like, just show up to all the services. <laughs> right. Like, right. Like, and these are, and these are with men over the years with men where I'm like, look, if the church is open on Saturday night for vigil, just come to church. If it's right. Sunday morning, just be in church. Right. There's a total plague in our society of just inconsistency. And, I, and uh, you know, all of these things are related. I mean, if you're a person who's like, I don't skip the gym, you will be a person that does not skip going to church. Uh, just, yeah, that's just, how I feel. I, I mean, those, are, those are like the, that yeah. and the grocery store, the gym and church and the grocery store. Those are like yeah. the only places I go. And I love going to church and I love going to yeah. the gym. It, it's well, totally you, you hardwire and you hardwire yourself to just do the things that you're supposed to do. Right. So. And, and that building that momentum, I've talked with some of the young guys that much of your life as a man is about building momentum. And so it, some of these guys, and, and maybe you have advice for anybody listening that doesn't know what their skill set is or where they're going to go in their life or how they're going to do it. And I tell them, you know, I, I'm not Jordan Peterson and just telling them to clean their room, but there's something to that. Like clean your room a little bit, like clean the space up go to the gym, eat a little cleaner, just build the momentum and things will start to fall into place. You have to build momentum in your life. And some guys have no momentum towards any one direction and they're not really sure where, where to start, but it's just little things. And once you have momentum going to the gym, like you said, for going to the church is second nature. And then once you are going to the church and you don't miss your Sunday liturgy and you don't miss your Saturday Vespers, now all of a sudden you're You've got the momentum. Now it feels strange if you don't show up. Well, and, and and you said something too about like making decisions, which is like, it's intimidating to get a physical job and to show up on the job site. It, it is. When you've never done it before, it's intimidating. It's been intimidating for me at times. Um, so I don't want to downplay that and say, but what you learn to do is just show up. And then when you do that for long enough, you build confidence so that you go, no matter where I show up, I know I'm going to show up. I know I'm going to put in the work. I know I'm right. going to do it. You, you know, confidence. Um, there is a famous jujitsu coach, John Danaher. Um, he talks a lot about confidence and, but confidence being the byproduct of skill. He's like, we shouldn't have fake confidence. He's like, you have confidence based on skill, what you've done. So, well, I totally agree with that. 
And there's just a few more comments I wanted to get your opinion on. System blower through in one, and it was when you were talking about uh, cycles of the workout regimen that you're on. He says, I take it Father Moses isn't a fan of Mike Metzner. Nah. But I mean, Mike Metzner was, I mean, no one's ever been able to duplicate it. He's a one of one personality of a certain style of training, and he was on a ton of gear. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, it was a genetic. He's such a genetic outlier yeah, and he was taking a lot of PEDs that there's a reason that his style of training hasn't been effective for people. Right. Yeah. And I saw, um, it was Arnold and who's the, uh, the quad father, um, blonde hair, shorter guy had huge legs. Oh, um, um yeah, come on, man. Um, it's escaping me right now. I feel everybody's terrible. been trying to duplicate his his uh, his uh, his technique on the hack squat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, this one says Tom Platts. But Tom Platts, that's it. Tom okay. Platts. Yeah. So Tom Platts uh, made a comment. He said, "Well, I don't know what Mike was talking about because when we were spending three days or three hours in the gym, he was right there with us. Yeah, talking about when he was because uh, he beat Tom Platts in one of the Olympias." Oh, okay. um, but, um, anyways, yeah. So got your take there. And then another person made a point when you were talking about PED and gear that Sam Solek, who is a very prominent, um, content creator. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. 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 So, um, I've talked with young guys at my gym that follow his stuff cause he's very popular and they're, they were like 22 and they were ready to get on gear because they've heard him talk about all his gains and he's massive now and he's very open about uh significant gear usage curious what your thoughts on people like sam are um obviously impressive what he's been able to build whether he's on gear or not again very dedicated to to what he's doing but what's your thought on on influencers like that and their influence on the youth well i mean look everything has a has a degree of danger component to it right so I remember years ago when I was roofing, somebody came up with my wife and she's like, is she's like, your job is dangerous. I'm like, it's the second or third most dangerous job in America. Literally, <laughs> you know, like um, now maybe flat roof commercial roof isn't as dangerous, but like people die. Right. So one thing we shouldn't do is downplay danger as like danger is uh, not a part of life. Danger is a part of life. Right. So taking PEDs, is dangerous for different reasons. It's probably safest when you're young, but it's also most likely to screw up your endocrine system so that you're not able to have children or to impede having children. So the purpose of life is not weightlifting or bodybuilding. The purpose of life is to glorify God, and to have a family, to be deified. So my problem is not that what Sam is doing is unsafe. My problem would be that it's a different goal than what a Christian should be looking to do. Right. I mean, it's it's the number one reason. It, to be honest, the number one reason. Even when I was around a lot of guys early on in powerlifting that were taking gear, I didn't take any, was because I was like, I don't want to screw up my endocrine system. Right. And there's lots of guys who get on gear who bomb out their tests, their endocrine can't get people, uh, can't get pregnant later on, or have major, major, major issues. Yep. So the, 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 the risk to reward there, I think is, um, not, doesn't make sense. Yeah. I know a guy at the gym where when he was in his late twenties, he got on gear and he was massive and he looked like, and I, he wanted to compete and stuff in bodybuilding. And I've seen him recently. Now he's in like his mid to later thirties and just looks like a fraction of who he used to be. And he's no longer on the gear, but if he would have just done it naturally, I would suspect that at his mid thirties, he would look pretty darn good if he had been working out for yeah. 10 years, as opposed to really peaking in the late twenties, taking a ton of gear. And then now his system's pretty much wrecked. He doesn't even well, look like the same guy is too, is that Sam is making loads of money. True. Right. So it's like, it's like being a football player. Like you're going to end up with some brain damage. It's not negotiable. It's going to happen. The question is, is it is the risk worth the reward? If you're supporting your family and you're doing these things and there's some downside or there's some danger, it makes sense. If you're doing stuff that is 
actively harming you that has no return on investment, that may not be a wise decision. So, right. yeah. And so last question on the, on the gear usage, just want to get an official statement from father Moses. So you're telling me that Michael Hearn, you don't think he's natty. <laughs> well, everybody knows it's duck eggs. And <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, man. That guy is like, I saw something the other day and I was like, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not like enamored with his personality, the way he kind of comes across, but I saw somebody had a video where they were making fun of him the other day. And I was like, dang on it, man. That guy just has the most incredible physique. I was like, he just does. He's like yeah. in his fifties. And I'm like, he, yeah, wow. he's like 53 or four. Yeah. And... I'm like, that is the genetic outlier. Like yeah. all like, so anyways, you got to tip your hat to him on that. That's point. what I, that's my general opinion, whether he's on gear or not. Uh, the, the well, fact he's 100% that hundred percent on gear, there's yeah, it, yeah. he's not on gear. Okay. Yeah. So. But, um, his, his work ethic and discipline yeah. and how he's maintained that physique since the age of 19 and he still lifts so damn heavy. Um, that no, he's, he's a freak, man. He's a freak. He's a freak. Yeah. But yeah, just wanted to, just wanted to say that, uh, anyways, father Moses, thank you so much for coming on. Really Thanks, appreciate man. it. Bless. Appreciate yeah, it. Anything everyone. you want to, say to the people before we hop off or how they no, might just, be able to reach out to you or, uh, yeah, just, I don't know, put the links in the bottom, but okay. I got my Instagram for weightlifting and, yeah, and Twitter. I got both. Yeah. Those. And my YouTube has my sermons and everything else on it. So oh, what's your YouTube? I haven't seen the YouTube. Uh, just, I think it's just father Moses McPherson. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that has all my homilies and oh, videos. And it's McPherson, else. not McPherson. There's no fear in McPherson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. It's P H E R S O N. It's not E A R S O N. There's no yeah. fear in it. You get that a lot. Yeah, everybody pronounced. I don't even correct people anymore. Well, yeah, I, I unless I they bring it up, that. and then I'll then I have my little zinger. So. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I'll include the social media links. Uh, thank awesome. you so much for coming on for another great conversation, and I will see you all watching. I'll be back tomorrow. And we'll be critiquing the spread of uh, magic, witchcraft, and sorcery on TikTok uh, tomorrow night. So I will see you all then. As always, until next time, God bless. Thank you.